and the first session is about challenges of climate change in, in Africa. Uh, so the first presentation will be by uh, uh, Joao Braga, and uh, he was a, he's, he's a New School alumni, by currently working at the uh, Brazilian Development Bank, and he will be presenting about climate challenges in Africa and Latin America. Joao, the floor is yours. Hold on, I, I'm texting with Joao. He, he just told me that he's uh, he's having problem with, with with the computer, so he's probably yeah he's he's coming in Zoom right now. Probably. If he he still have problems uh, with the uh, connection, we can probably move to the next uh, present presenter in the meantime. So, what do you think, Professor Ely? Then he is doing this after Miriam's talk. Yeah, Miriam, you want to do first? Yeah, because he has problems with the connection to through Zoom. They're using another system in Brazil. I know I gave a lecture there four or five days ago for the Brazilian Treasury, as they have another system they're operating, and so that might not be so compatible what we are doing. Okay, so, oh. So our next presenter, we have uh, Marianne Pouret, uh, who will present about climate change impact on agricultural production and, uh, and food security in sub-Saharan Africa, and particularly um, uh, uh, our study on, on Senegal. So Mariam, your the floor is yours. You think you can stay close to the microphone so we can hear uh, the, for those who are online. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Hi, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present some of my work to this workshop. Uh, so we'll first talk about Senegal a little bit. Maybe some of you heard the name of the country for the first time. So where is it located? It's in the westernmost part of the African continent with a current population of 18.4 million. So the main economic um, sector is driven by the service sector, followed by the industrial and the agricultural sector. So even though the agricultural sector is only 17.5% of the national GDP, most of the population is uh, depending on that uh, sector. For livelihood, especially in the rural area. So for staple crops, we have uh, rice, maize, sorghum, and pear millet, and crops such as uh, sugarcane, um, cotton, and um, well, forgot, but those are cash crops. So crops that are used for export purposes, those have ancient origins all the way to colonial era, but that's a topic for another day. Uh, since we're talking about climate change, let's um, look at uh, climate trends, uh, especially annual maximum and minimum temperature. So we have dates from 1900 to 2020, and we see in the first two graphs an overall increase in annual max and minimum temperature, 
just for the rainfall, you have a sharp decrease, and then you see erratic rainfall rates, which are lower than it used to be earlier. So these are can be explained in some of the literature as the reduction of the amount of land that is receiving adequate precipitation for agricultural purposes. So this, especially what we observe in the last 40 era is at the origin of um, some serious natural event disasters such as drought in rural area and floods, especially in urban area. So these constitute serious um, consequences for Senegalese who rely on lakes, land, and seas in order to not only feed themselves, but to also, um, but to also uh, earn a living. So we can say that climate shock is adding an another stress and yeah. Yeah, 36, 30, 36.5 degrees Celsius, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I was saying that these natural disaster events are at the origins of um, of uh, consequences in the, in the Senegalese population who are already struggling from the consequences of climate variability, ongoing uh, environmental degradation and widespread poverty. So two things before we move on is that Senegal is part of the um, Sahelian zone. So it's a belt of 11 to 12 Western African countries that are characterized by a single rainy season that occurs between June and August. So besides that period, we do not expect precipitation at all. Another thing when we talk about natural disaster in this uh, country is the severe drought event that happened in 1970, which you can see uh, is being materialized here. So since that period, 1970, we see a rapid increase in both annual maximum and minimum temperature, whereas we see a sharp decrease in precipitation, and you see the values that are being lower than it used to be like earlier years. So acknowledging this, there is also an additional graph I would like to show you, which is data from the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration where we are looking looking in Senegal at the uh, frequencies of natural disaster events. So the country, we mainly have droughts and, flood, and floods. And we see from earlier times, we have uh, recurrent episodes of uh, drought. So in the uh, y-axis, we have the numbers of either floods or droughts in a single year. So again, you see after 1970, we have a uh, frequency that is even higher. And we see what is interesting is after 2015, we see the occurrence of floods. So rainfall rates starting to pick up again, increasing a lot, which are causing, uh, causing floods, as I showed in the previous picture, uh, especially in rural, in urban area. So acknowledging this relationship between climate trends and the natural disaster events, uh, the purpose of this research will be to look more into how will this affect uh, food security, especially in the youngest population, so child malnutrition. So what the literature says when looking at the World Food Program is that this is uh, in the country, in Senegal, 15% of rural households and over 8% of urban households are food insecure. And the agriculture sector is subject to at, mo at least 10% of gross production loss due to those unmanaged risks, including climate change. And the crop production was reduced by 11 times due to those adverse weather events. And one thing that is very interesting here is that every time that we see, so in this graph, we have data from 1973 to 2020, and we are looking at agricultural production uh, shocks. So every time that we see a shock in the agricultural production, we, there is always a extreme weather event, either a severe drought, as the one that happened in 1970, or you have late rains or erratic rainfall patterns. So in red, we have the food production index, and in blue, the, pr um, the crop production index. So another round of literature review from the FAO and the International Assessment of Agricultural Science and 
technology for development, this is worldwide. So 10% of humanity was suffering from hunger in 2022, and 35 million more people were pushed into hunger from 2020 to 2023. And uh, those unchecked climate uh, change effects really affect the yield production, as we will see later on, and also the price of those paper crops. And uh, the power is predicting a 20% more uh, malnourished children in 2050, that is globally. And we'll see how this number is compared to uh, Senegal, the specific case of Senegal. And what is more dramatic with climate change, I think Professor was mentioning, is that it's coinciding with uh, um, increasing demand for food, and that is only exacerbating the food uh, security issue in the region. Another interesting finding from the World Food Program is that when looking at Senegal, the center of the country is where we will see the most um, dense agricultural activity, but yet it is the part of the country that is suffering the most from that. And when trying to understand, um, I took data from the FAO looking at, so in the right, on the right axis, you have the import quantities of cereals in tons, so that is the blue line, and in red you have the export quantities of cereals, also expressed in tons. So the reason why I wanted to put it together is when looking at the values in the axis, so here we have uh, 300,000 tons for the import quantities, and for the export quantities, the highest value is 10,000 um, tons. So that is to say that Senegal has become a net importer of cereals and also food and agricultural products in general. Those not only include cereals that I have here, rice, maize, and sorghum, but it also includes livestock products, which are essential products if you want to reduce um, food insecurity and improve the nutritional status of individuals. So that was for a round of literature review. So what I did then was to predict the cereal production for 2050 and 2080, based on different scenarios of uh, climate values. And then the chapter three is kind of a logical continuity where we look at the role of technology, the quality of soil, and planting area. So how these three might impact um, cereal production. And then we look at globally in child malnutrition, what policy issues are there, and what role can could potentially be played by climate finance. So let's quickly talk about the highlights of chapter two. So as I was mentioning, I was talking about the central part of the country. So I looked at three main parts. Why three main parts? Because the country is characterized by three agroecological zones. So the north is arid, the receiving not much precipitation. The central part of the country is kind of soft humid, whereas the south is uh, very humid. So, yeah, and then I look at regions and these coordinates needed for the top line. Anyways, for the data source, I use the FAO stat and NASA. So in order to get the historical harvested area production in yield for the major cereals that I, I am working on, rice, maize, sorghum, and millet, I took it from there. Uh, for the weather data, in order to get daily weather data from 1990 to 2020, I took it from this website, the NASA Power, which is a nice website, by the way. So it gives you the, the, the um, weather data needed for a given any place in the world. And for the soil data, I just looked at the literature review that defined the soil profile for Western African countries, especially in Senegal. For the crop model, I'll briefly mention about it. It's uh, an open software model, the SAT, which is uh, predicting crop uh, growth based on uh, genotypes, environment, things like that. So not to be too technical, I'm just focusing on the input value that is needed in the model for those daily weather data, the soil profile, and crop management data, such as row spacing, um, the amount of cultivar, the amount of fertilizers, etc. 
And the output that I'm interested more is the harvested yield that is being expressed in kilogram per hectare. So that's all I wanted to say about the crop model. If there are any questions of how it works, I can definitely answer to that. Uh, so the climate change scenario. So remember the NASA website provide historical weather data, but what if I want to get weather data for 2050 and 2080, daily weather data? So uh, there is a um, website called the Markson Climate Projection. So it defines, uh, gives weather data based on different scenarios of greenhouse gas emission. So RCP stands for representative concentration pathway. So 2.6 means uh, the lowest emission scenario, meaning that uh, it corresponds to 2.6 watt per meter square greenhouse gas emission. And the highest or the more pessimistic scenario is when we have 8.5 watt per meter square. So there are two intermediate uh, climate scenarios but I just wanted to look at the two extremes and see how will these affect uh, maximum, minimum temperature as well as rainfall. So remember I had three, we have three uh, study sites for 2050 and for 2080, and I was comparing how maximum and minimum temperature will differ based on the greenhouse gas emission. So you see for max and minimum temperature, they occurred when we have the highest um, the highest emission scenario. For annual precipitation is the opposite, pretty much. And any questions about this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for the, yes, yeah, yes, yes. Okay. So yeah, this is just to give an overview of how these change based on the different greenhouse gas emission scenario. So changes in area. Remember to get the predicted uh, um, the, the production. We need to do the product of area and also um, the yield. So for the area, I came up with based on the literature these four different scenarios. That is because there hasn't been any scientific evidence in the literature which could tell us how would um, how would the planting area change over time. So they come up with two hypotheses. In one case, they say there will be a reduction in the planting area due to disruption in supply chain. And on the other side, they say there might be an increase in the planting area due to an uh, um, increased access to credit, but also the shift of uh, labor from uh, rural, from urban to uh, rural areas. Okay. Um, yes, here what I'm trying to explain is that my reference year is 2020. So let's say if the planting area was 100 hectare, and then the different scenarios I'll consider for 2050 would be from 90 hectare all the way to 110. So just to see how different possibilities we have for the planting area. So before moving to the results there, I just made some few assumptions I wanted to keep in mind is that I kept this second chapter simple just to look at the uh, effect of climate change. So I kept the same quality of soil, I kept the same cultivar and the same amount of fertilizer that was used in 2050. That being said, before moving into uh, uh, Before moving to the result, what I did was to uh, kind of calibrate the crop model. So in blue, you have the, the um, simulated yield with fertilizer. And uh, in green, you have the simulated yield in orange, the simulated yield without fertilizer. And in gray, you have the actual yield. So the actual yield value, I got it from FAOSTAT and the blue and orange line were the simulations done by the crop model. So from here, we can see for the different crops, rice, maize, sorghum, and millet, that um, the, the simulation with fertilizer seems to be doing a better job at predicting uh, historical yield. So now that I trust enough the model, I went on to do the prediction for 2050 and 2080. 
Right. So here in the x-axis, we have the different scenarios of planting area, which I talked about earlier. And in the uh, y-axis, we have the simulated production expressed in kilogram, again, for our four crops. So um, in overview, what we can say when we combine uh, the, the production of the four crops is that for 2050, based on the scenarios of greenhouse gas emission, we have this variation of the total area of production from 3.71 billion kilograms to 4.52 billion kilograms in 2050. And without the numbers for 2.44 billion to 2.82. So might be um, something which especially um, affect us. But I will start chapter two, just briefly talk about the influence of uh, technology here. So what I did was to look at other promising cultivars uh, instead of using the one that um, the for 2050 and 2080, the one that I have for 2020. Uh, with the literature review, they were looking at promising and alternative varieties of cultivars. So for each crop, I looked at two different cultivars and here I summarized the results. So in blue, we have the improved cultivar and in red, we have the cultivars that we'll use in chapter two. So when looking at the production, uh, we can see that when we have better cultivars, there are ways to increase the maximum production in both years, 2050 and 2080. And here, uh, the main conclusion is that for promising technology, we can increase the potential cereal production by 852 million kilograms in 2050, even more. 2.24 billion kilogram in 2080. No, Mariam, you have five more minutes. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, for the changing quality of soil, um, here I was just looking at um, another soil profile. So, the sandy soil profile, which is the worst case scenario, because again, in the literature, they weren't uh, optimistic about future quality of soil. So they said the worst case scenario would be having the sandy soil profile. And you see that these two lines shows us that um, the production would be uh, very low compared to what we have in chapter two. And I'm going to be running because I wanted to show you the child malnutrition effect. So this is for the planting area. I might come back later to that, but let me talk about child malnutrition. This is something that I was really interested in. So this comes from uh, the UN, one of the UN uh, regression model when they were looking at child malnutrition and they defined it as being um, uh, as being uh, related to per calorie uh, availability. So per calorie availability, the ratio of male to female uh, life expectancy at birth the amount of female that went to secondary school and the access to safe water. So in order to compute the number of malnourished children, it would be that uh, percent variation times the child population. Okay. And the main result that I have here when I computed the child malnutrition is that up to, uh, up to 15,000 children might be pushed to malnutrition from 2050 to 2080 in the country. So when we have, of course, the worst case scenario, uh, that is the main result. So here, the status quo is a really good example, uh, the typical case, but these are for the business um, business analysis. So after these main results, there are also policy issues and recommendations. Um, so let me focus on the recommendations. So here, based on the international Intergovernmental Panel of uh, Climate Change, they talked about such um, recommendation as cultivar improvements and also crop insurance for the future and also delivering food from surplus area to deficit area so that the price of those staple crops will at least be less volatile. Um, in terms of climate finance, the country receives many grants such as from the Green Climate Fund, from the Germany International Climate Initiative, and the uh, USAID. And for green bonds, you know, there might be questions about that, but 
there are several challenges in terms of the framework, in terms of regulations and verifying. And the literature argues that it could definitely make a difference into reversing and avoiding the, the environmental catastrophe. So I'm painfully done, but I wanted to say a few words about this conference that happened like uh, two months ago. And it was talking about the transition from net zero for developing in emerging countries. And it also provides um, some potential solutions into how those countries could um, reach their net transition. Um, another important point is that they say, to this issue to be taken seriously, we are talking about billions of US dollars, where our tri trillions are needed to, uh, to finance this climate change um, um, policies in, in general. So that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mayan. Thank you. So we have, we have we now have like five minutes uh, for questions. Uh, for the audience uh, present uh, on the site, if you can also get close to the microphone, or I mean, I don't know how how is working out there, but in order to be able to hear you from uh, from from Zoom, we need a microphone as well. First off, I want to say that was an amazing presentation, and I'm like terrified because. <laughs> The thing is that, you know, I'm I'm married to a scientist and looking at the data, it looks, you know, we're almost at that drop dead um, date, not date, um, temperature of 104 Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius in regards to the photosynthesis. I know it's like worst case scenario, yeah, yeah. but worst case scenario could happen. And so, you know, very possible that it could happen. Um, and, uh, you know, you suggested uh, adaptation, which I think is really important. And because we're kind of like, oh, well, I, just, I think it's really important. What do you think that we can do as economists to kind of really stress this idea that we need to be investing more um, in uh, places like Senegal in regards to adaptation because people will actually, you know, they will be harmed. Um, I mean, are, I mean that, that's kind of like, Question. Like, what do you think we, you know, I mean, I guess that's kind of a complicated question. <laughs> well, yeah, it's a very good one. And uh, that's why I wanted to mention this uh, global meetings of uh, the Emerging Markets Forum. So they were saying, as just the last sentence I ended with, uh, international organizations are talking about billions of US dollars. But when uh, some, uh, like the, uh, the COP21, one, I think there were two main forums that said, yes, if you want to take this seriously, we need to talk about trillions of US dollars. And uh, we need some frameworks. We need to have some standards so that everyone, because they are all doing things at their own, like the World Bank doing their own stuff, the UN their own stuff. So it's good to have standards so that we can better measure how they are taking this into account. And there is also another type of solution where they talk about uh, countries doing carbon taxation so meaning that if uh, we can incentivize people to be less consumers of fossil fuels and things like that but we are trying to see how that could be practical in the specific case of senegal because the dramatic issue is that we're just trying to copy what have been done in developing in developed economies whereas we don't have the same uh, realities so still working on it it's a good question but i don't have the answer if I can ask a quick question, maybe quick. Do they actually have varieties of plants that are doing better above 35 centigrade to 40, which is where you have the drop off of productivity? Or is this, well, we might do things in the future if we look for it, because I think of all of the promised technologies that we've been offered that haven't come true, but someone had a really great idea that this could happen. So are, do they actually have good varieties that are productive at these high levels to maintain food production? Or is this just, well, we hope we have some in the future? Yeah, that's a good point as well. So when I was talking about the promising varieties, some of them has already been te uh, tested, but at the experimental level. 
So again, they, uh, the main issue is again, climate finance in order to expand those research, not only expand it, but also to apply it to more real world. So they are doing research as the crops I'm showing the varieties, but uh, again, limited due to uh, the climate finance issue. Uh, I uh, we have one a room for one more question. If someone from the uh, uh, from the online uh, audience, uh, anyone have a question? Otherwise, we can also ask whether there is another question from the audience in New York. So I had a question here in New York. Okay. Um, uh, has there been a change in the mix of cereals and other crops? from the climate change that's happened and um, in the past. And I, and I thought I recall that sorghum was uh, recommended as a more robust climate resistant crop. And what have there been shifts before that we can learn from? Um, can you repeat the last part shift? From oh, um, the, the, the mix of... Right. It, the, there's two parts to the question. One, has the mix of crops changed from the climate change that we've had um, in the last how many years? Uh, and um, that the farmers have done themselves. And I do recall that there have been some policy um, recommendations for that. And then, um, um, so. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, are, they, are there changes or improvements? If I understand very well from uh, and, any shifts in the past of the mix, I guess you're so, from what I hear <laughs> hearing yeah. Uh, yeah. the there hasn't been changes that the mixes have been fairly stable for a long period. Yes, yes, that that's exactly what I wanted to say because again they are not only um, missing money for that but also the incentives just to do it. Because, uh, as I say, in the worst case scenario, things looks very, very ugly. But um, yeah, they are. Mo it's moving very slowly. It hasn't been much change. <laughs> I wanted to say more, but yeah. Thank, Thank you, Miriam, for your presentation again. Uh, it's it's really uh, really interesting, very topical as well. Uh, I have I had also a question, but for the interest of time, we have to move to the next presentation. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just send you an email in that case. So next presentation, we have Joao uh, Braga. And uh, as I said before, he works at uh, Brazilian Development Bank, and he will be also presenting on climate change challenges in Africa and Latin America. Joao, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brian, really as well for inviting me to to join the workshop it's not too easy to talk after uh, Mariam's presentation which was great my presentation would not be as technical as Mariam's uh, presentation the idea here is to bring uh, some of the climate policies that are that have been implemented in Brazil uh, under uh, the Lula's administration uh, since the beginning of the year and try to relate this with the climate research agenda that we have at the new school uh, that I have also undertaken during, during my PhD with uh, Professor Will Semler and also that our colleague, uh, Zé Pedro, who is also working in the Brazilian government for the Minister of Finance, who in he's also a PhD student, is also implementing there. So first of all, uh, I would like just to emphasize, and Mariam uh, somehow also mentioned that in her presentation, that as we've been discussing for years, there are no policy that fits all. Uh, and Brazil and other developing countries uh, has specificities that, that should be considered uh, in climate challenge that should be also taken into account when designing policies. Uh, so the first uh, 
issue that I should that I want to mention in Brazil is that like energy is not an issue at all, as it is in, in advanced countries. Uh, the biggest uh, Brazil is the fifth largest emit emitter in the world. However, it's much the emissions are much more related to the forestation, land use, and agriculture, not energy. As the energy matrix is already super clean. Uh, we have our NDCs, and this is what actually drivers that drives the policy. Um, also, and this is and this is also important for a climate research agenda. Uh, climate scenarios are are guiding uh, the policies, and we know that uh, policies that we have that, that are implemented and the NDCs, the contributions that the countries have already uh, announced, are not enough to reach the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal of the Paris Agreement by 2050. So uh, we should implement more policy and more aggressive policies, not only in, in, in the developing world, but also in, also in advanced countries. So what do we have right now uh, in terms of green economic policy in the country? We have two big new economic programs, uh, a new industrial policy, and this industrial policy has climate and green investments as a transversal, transversal or cross-section uh, driver. Uh, a new infrastructure program, which is the second one, and ecological and, and, and an ecological transition plan that are being announced right now at COP28. And it's important to note that we have we are having this workshop during COP28, uh, which is super important politically saying. Um, for developing countries and not and not not only in Latin America but in, in Africa in Asia, we know that climate disasters are a risk. Uh, here are some studies from Professor Willy uh, showing the, the, the frequency for, from climate disasters and also and also uh, the potential GDP losses that we, we could have uh, because of this type of trans this type of climate risks, but also what I want to emphasize in here for economic policy are the transition risks. Uh, and here uh, in the left, a paper that was just released by also by a former new school student, Gregor, uh, showing that at least 1.53, 1.4 trillion dollars in assets are at risk in financial markets. Uh, and and they are mostly held by uh, advanced countries investors, which is a risk for financial markets and mature uh, countries. And also the, the European Central Bank stress tests here. Finally, and here I start mention our own research at the new school that that from, from I studied together with Professor Willy and also with Mariam. Uh, showing that for developing countries, climate change is a risk also because of the volatility of carbon intensive assets to business cycles. What have you show, what, what have we shown there in this uh, World Bank report actually? Uh, that as carbon intensive assets are more volatile to oil, to oil price shocks, uh, there are risks related to depend on carbon. And if you compare this with green bonds, green bonds are much less volatile. So it can be also used as a head for investors. Here's an example of the COVID-19 shock when we know that uh, oil prices have skyrocketed uh, right at the beginning. Uh, and here we can see that the energy bonds, the returns have decreased. It was the opposite, actually, not skyrocket. But uh, the, the, the energy bonds returns have sharply decreased, while the green bonds remained more stable, as you could say. And this is super important, uh, especially if you think of investors' appetite for risk. 
And this is another study that we did, uh, the new school, uh, showing that investors already price green assets benefits uh, because they have lower yields, but with a better risk return relation, better sharp ratios. And now being working at the development bank, working with green finance there, the climate department of the bank, you can see that it, now it's a kind of, um, it, it's, it's kind of well known in the markets that there are benefits in investing green, not only because of returns, but also because they usually are related to investors based diversification which is also uh, good for, uh, for investors who want to read different, different markets. And finally, uh, investors are also valuing ESG practices, not only the use of proceeds of bonds or the, or the use of proceeds of investments, but if firms, banks, and governments have great ESG practices. This is super important and it's new and it's a trend uh, from the past five years, I should say, that we have captured uh, in our research. This is uh, a chart from Societe Générale, uh, which there mentioned exactly that, that investing green is better and, and uh, firms and banks should consider and improve their ESG practices. Finally, and also talking in the, in the perspective of a developing country, we know that cycles and commodity price cycles have been an issue for years for developing countries in terms of not, 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 not only have, having a sustainable growth uh, path, uh, but also to ensure that we have uh, industrial diversification in the countries to the dependence of this kind of, of goods. Here in this study, uh, José Pedro and I, uh, we have compared uh, commodity prices, green assets, and carbon intensive assets returns. And here again, uh, it shows that climate risks are very lately related to commodity price dependence risks. Uh, we compare, we compare uh, green bonds and carbon intensive returns with agricultural prices, with iron ore prices, with several commodity prices. And for all of them, uh, green bonds perform well, perform better. And I, I want also to add some uh, studies by the uh, IFD, which is the French Development Agency, showing that uh, again, that the industrial restructure is related to climate risks and defending the role of a green, of a green industrial policy. Here, they, com they compare uh, trade exposure to sectors with transition risks and fiscal revenue exposure as well to sectors with transition risks. And here, they also confirm that this is an issue for them. There are higher risks of depending in these sectors that are actually energy intensive sectors or commodity sectors. And there are risks in terms of losing uh, fiscal revenues, but also of being more vulnerable in terms of external debts. Brazil is here, so we're not among the, the, the countries with the largest risks as we have a more diversified industrial structures, but it's still true that this should be taken into account. So now back to, 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 the, to the policies. Uh, so this is the background for having a green industrial policy, for having a green infrastructure policy, for having an ecological transition plan uh, here coordinated by the Minister of Finance, so in the heart of the economic policy of the country. Uh, José Pedro, who, who I mentioned before, is in the Minister of Finance. He's in charge of implementing the Brazilian carbon market. Finally, we finally have a carbon market in Brazil to price carbon. However, it's not a carbon tax. And it's important to note, as our, as our research, the NISCO also discussed the benefits 
or the disadvantages of having a carbon market versus a carbon taxes, carbon tax. Uh, though this carbon market here, like everything in Portuguese, it's, it's a picture. It shows the the flow of allocation of fundings from the carbon market. Uh, here is just to show that the, the idea is that the revenues for the carbon markets from the auctions for the carbon auctions of the carbon markets can be invested uh, in uh, activities like, for example, uh, uh, projects for low-income households. So you can decrease the, 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 the political risks of, of ca carbon taxes. Why the political risks? Uh, our, our, our studies at the New School also show that there, there are some political constraints in implementing carbon prices. Why? Because first carbon price can be inflationary, increase prices, and can of course decrease, uh, in this case, wealth, the welfare. And one of the uh, lessons that we had uh, in our uh, research program is that in the first bullet here, climate policy must combine carbon pricing like tax or ETS, which is a carbon market, with, with, with a plan to fund and the risk of green investments in the short and long term. Why? In the second bullet here, uh, to, redu to reduce the social costs from the carbon price. But at the same time that you are pricing carbon intensive activities, you are giving, you are providing alternatives for, 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 for the consumers or for the investors, a lower price alternatives to speed up the results. And again, now to finalize of the four final slides. Oh, what does uh, the banking sector have to, have to do with that? So uh, I'm working for the Development Bank in Brazil. We do, we do economic policy, but we also fund uh, uh, investment programs, like infrastructure programs. Uh, that's the largest development bank in the world. Like it's, it's uh, it's almost the same size of the World Bank. It's in charge of financing 20% of the credit flows in Brazil, 20% of the credit market, and 100% of the long-term credit in the country. Uh, since 2000, uh, we had $200 billion of projects, infrastructure projects. Right now, our portfolio of infrastructure is $55 billion. Um, and also uh, pioneers uh, in green finance issuing green bonds and the largest green finance uh, green financier in the world. Like we are larger than uh, the European Investment Bank in terms of portfolio of green energy. Of course, because Brazil has a very clean energy matrix, but of course we have uh, ability to scale up investment. And this is super important for economic policy because we have a public bank able to catalyze and channel uh, funds to, to green investments. And this is also related to, to, to uh, a study that uh, this is part of my dissertation and really and I have published at the Journal of Economic Dynamics Control, uh, which is the risk of green investments with green bonds, showing that, uh, that we, we should have at the same time carbon pricing and a strategy to provide subsidies for green investment so we can uh, scale up and increase the speed of, of, uh, of the transition, avoiding climate risks in the near term as well. And in that sense, now the two last slides, uh, we, we were part of the first sovereign uh, bond issue for our country. Uh, and this, the, 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 the green bonds, sustainable bonds actually, was issued last month uh, in the international markets. And what, what they were able to leverage $2,000 billion in financial markets, and 100% of the resources will be channeled to, to BNDES, to the Brazil Development Bank Climate Fund. So we can increase climate invest before the carbon market is actually implemented, which is expected to the next two years.
and also just to finalize so so we can uh, be more transparent for investors and ensure that the resources are actually channeled to to green investments we have also developed a new taxonomy and framework for for green investments uh, having the EU taxonomy and the Mexican and the Colum taxonomy and the Colombian Mex taxonomy as as benchmarks. Uh, and why I, I mentioned I mentioned the, the taxonomy here because I, I believe that uh, this is the main challenge for developing countries in terms of green finance, being able to define their own green investment patterns, so we can attract green investments and so we can be able to design our own green industrial policy. So that's all. So thank you so much. Uh, this, this is these are my emails, my email, my uh, .gov email as well. If you want to reach out and and, and chat. So thank you so much. Thank you, Joao. Thank you. Any any question from the audience in New York? Yes, this is Lark in New York. Um, that was a wonderful presentation, and I kind of have a kind of like a theoretical question. Through the political economy lens, why do you think hegemony prefers carbon bonds to green bonds? Like it seems to prefer, I don't know what people prefer, but why do you think ide like through an ideological lens, why that seems to be the the the, the idea that they're pushing in the West? Thank you. Uh, so uh, the question is, why investors prefer carbon-intensive bonds than green bonds? Yes. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah no, maybe Willie can also help me, but uh, uh, of course the, the carbon-intensive activities returns are, are higher and more stable as several uh, green investments are still uh, at their early stage. What I, what I have noticed in our research, the new school and now uh, working in the financial markets that the most, the majority of the investments that have been funded by green bonds in financial markets are renewable energy investments. What does it mean? It means that the, we, are, we are funding a large utility firms, large, large energy firms that are already able to implement uh, renewable energy investments with higher returns, because you know that the renewable energy costs have sharply decreased in the past years. Um, however, uh, we have noticed that some investors, especially institutional investors, that are able, that have portfolio goals for ESG bonds have a preference for green bonds and carbon intensive bonds. Uh, and personally, I would add uh, an additional insight on our research as well. That's the role of the central banks in changing pre investors' preferences. And that's something that the ECB have been working on uh, that's actually changing the, the capital allocation incentives of banks so it can change preferences. That's a big challenge. Thank you. Uh, I, I would just add to, to what Braga said here, here to Joao, sorry, is there's also an issue I've, through my readings and my research of what we call greenwashing. And many of the instruments that pretend to be called, that, that are called green bonds, they, in, in effect, they not 100% uh, carry uh, green projects. So or they finance not 100% a green project. But the problem is not because of the uh, intention of the, of the firm that issued the bond, but because there is no real, uh, I would say, uh, clear guideline to how to classify those bonds. And uh, that, that's, that's another issue, I think, that can be problematic in adopting green bonds. Any question from the uh, from the online audience?
Well, back to New York. Any question in the... Yes, uh, one more. Uh, yes. Where does the capital for the Brazilian National Development Bank come from? Uh, it comes from, from taxes, uh, actually, yeah. But it's it's a very stable fund. It was created during the 60s. And then we are able to fund long-term projects, like 20, 30 years projects sometimes. Thank you. Just a remark on the greenwashing. Uh, this is uh, definitely a big danger. But... Uh, what firms now are clearing themselves as the ESG firms, also as uh, firms among the MSCI, this is a big world uh, index, they can declare themselves as, a, as a ESG firms. So it's voluntary definition. And there's, of course, uh, a lot of uh, catching of the... Uh, general sentiment, you've got to do something for the green development, and so you, you do that. So the issue is um, the disclosure requirement now that are into, uh, required as soon by SEC, SEC in the uh, US uh, 2000, I think, 24, and the EU will require this. That means that the firms have to disclose their CO2 emission. And that will, uh, is a requirement, if that's uh, introduced, the greenwashing will be uh, at least uh, constrained a lot. So, um, but up to now, it's all voluntary, uh, you're right, but uh, the uh, legal uh, uh, definition now soon about disclosure requirement will um, help to avoid this. Yeah, great. So it seems we don't have additional questions, neither uh, from the online audience nor from the new school from the NSSR department audience. Uh, well, I guess we can then conclude the first session. Thank you, uh, Miriam. Thank Mariam, sorry. Thank you, Mariam, and thank you, Joao, for your presentations. Uh, very insightful. Uh, I think now. We can go to the second session. Yeah, all right, I think we're about ready. Um, so this is a bit of a, a change of uh, pace. Um, neither Achilles nor I are economists. Um, so we'll, we'll talk in language that most people can understand, um, I hope. Um, but um, we're glad to be here to talk about uh, the climate migration, both the, 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 the first um, two discussions, one on um, Miriam's on, on adaptation, uh, and then the second on, on investment and really on mitigation um, issues. Um, both these um, relate to the movement of people uh, due to climate change. And what we want to talk about first, Achilles will talk a bit about um, uh, on migration, and then I will uh, spend some time talking about the legal norms and institutions that relate. So. As I say, we're a bit a bit out of the flow of the the general uh, workshop here, but we hope that we'll provide kind of useful background to you, and then suggest ways in which we think um, the work that that you do, the economists do, would be very helpful in the kinds of policy questions um, that we face uh, in our work, and perhaps spark additional work uh, at the new school on these issues. So, uh, over to you. Okay. Excellent, and I want to thank also the organizers for uh, putting this together. So I, I decided to change a little bit my presentation last minute because Alex told me to bring some of the facts that we know about climate migration. And the reality is that we don't have many facts, particularly when it comes to the future. We're particularly bad at, at forecasting uh, how many people are going to move. It is a very strong political issue. We tend to get the sort of kind of estimates like this one here, which doesn't tell us really much, right? From 25 million to 1 billion environmental migrants, right? There's a whole discussion that can be said 
about the different models that are there. But what we do know is that we have already started experiencing significant movements due to environmental change, both in terms of uh, slow onset change, like uh, uh, the drought in the Sahel and the sort of movements that we see, but also due to extreme weather events, right? Where you have displacement, this sort of displacement might be much shorter in terms of, uh, 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 in terms of the duration or much shorter in terms of the distance uh, that it's covered. So uh, uh, part of the, uh, you know, the, the reason why I think these sort of estimates can be of, of, of great importance has to do with, with the way some of these numbers are interpreted, right? And one of the, uh, uh, interesting things is that a lot of the big projections about climate migrants in the future are a, a increasingly used in, in, in a rhetoric to try and say, okay, how do we close the borders? How do we make sure actually that there's no climate migrants or climate refugees coming, in this case, from Senegal, right, a, 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 to European countries? So a, I think what is interesting uh, here is that a lot of the numbers that we do have or a lot of the information that we do have tells us certain things. First of all, that a lot of the movements we see due to climate-related reasons uh, uh, are short-term movement, uh, short-distance movements, right? A lot of what we, we can characterize as climate migration tends to be internal migration, right? A lot of it tends to stay within specific sub-regions or regions. So let's say in West Africa, a lot of the movements tend to stay within the West African uh, a, 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 a region, right? Or, or in Sub-Saharan Africa more generally, right? The second uh, aspect that, 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 that we know of is that this is an extremely complex process in terms of migration. This is one way to... Uh, uh, explain uh, or, or to try and, and, and codify uh, the decision to migrate, right? We have a series of different reasons, environmental drivers, social drivers, intervening obstacles and facilitators, including policies, pro, uh, policy frameworks, uh, diaspora networks, the personal characteristics of the households. All of these can influence a, a, the decision to migrate. But also, what is interesting in this graph is that environmental drivers can be both direct drivers, but also indirect drivers, right? Uh, later on, I'm going to speak a little bit more about uh, research that we have conducted in, in, in Africa and, 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 and provide some further uh, uh, you know, empirical views, right? So we did a research uh, in uh, four different African countries, and we focused in, in, in cities, in urban areas in these countries, looking or starting to look at the idea of where climate migrants go, right? The earlier presentation in Senegal was talking about agricultural shocks, right? And the agricultural shocks have an effect on the decision to migrate. A lot of people have to diversify their income. One way to diversify that income is by going into urban areas and focusing on economic activities that don't have to do so much with agriculture, but more so with the service sector, because you don't have a big industrial sector in this case. So one of the main things that, that we find in terms of, of the numbers is that a lot of the effects of migration are going to be localized, right? Sub-Saharan Africa in particular is going to experience a lot of these movements if we compare it, for instance, with Latin America or if we compare it with uh, other re regions in the world. That's not to say that we're not going to have uh, displacement and migration due to environmental change everywhere, but this is more to say that uh, a lot of the, you know, the strongest one population movement that we're going to see is going to be in these areas, right? Now, what is interesting is that even some of the uh, uh, more pessimistic predictions, uh, if we take them into the context of, of kind of greater demographic transformations that might be occurring in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, are only a very small amount of what we, we are uh, actually expected to experience. What do I mean by that? We're expecting that African cities, which are about one billion now, are going to double their population, so by 2050. And at the same time, we're expecting the most pessimistic scenario, according to uh, some models developed by the World Bank. Uh, uh, we expect to have about uh, uh, 130 million climate migrants within this movement, right? So the one billion is 
clearly a very important number. And what is interesting when it comes to the climate migration is how some of these movements might coincide with more traditional patterns such as rural to urban migration and the urbanization process that is still ongoing in many of these cities. Now, from a policy perspective and, and from the findings from my research, what we saw is that while at the international level and specifically at the regional level in sub-Saharan Africa, you start seeing a lot of movement in terms of new norms being developed in terms of the recognition that climate change might be uh, an issue uh, that will lead to displacement and migration. Uh, at, at the urban level, we see very different processes that in, in, instead of trying to uh, embrace this idea of migration as adaptation to climate change, we see that it works often in, in very contradictory and, 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 and unjust ways, in some sense, right? So a lot of the time what we see happening is people moving from rural areas into cities, but not achieving any sort of adaptation in the cities that they arrive because of the conditions that they might find in cities or because of the way cities are managing urban growth more generally and population movements uh, more specifically, right? We found three kind of main drivers of this. One is inertia, so the idea that as cities are growing, uh, governments are not responding to the increase in population. In the main the way by the, of, of, of doing this is basically by not reacting to increases in density, increases uh, 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 in the number of, uh, uh, of people and the needs that people might have in these places. The practice of evictions, and increasingly the practice of evictions that it's based on a climate rationale, right? So the idea that you need to move because this is an environmentally sensitive area or because you are threatened by environmental change. And processes of relocation that are quite badly designed. So the idea of taking people from quite central areas within cities to uh, a areas in the periphery of cities or further away from the periphery of cities where economic opportunities are not there. And oftentimes, uh, the long-term effect of this is that relocation does not necessarily work and people tend to go back into the city living in informal settlements without having access to uh, 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 services, right? So, you know, one of the main points that I'm going to make is how some of these urban strategies are working and how we can think of them in order to address mobility, right? I'm going to show you some images of what I'm talking about and, and the idea of policy inertia. And this is one of the settlements where we collected uh, data. We did uh, uh, surveys where we collected about 800 responses from each of the settlements that, uh, uh, that we worked in, both from migrants and non-migrants, people who were born in these areas, and this is, you know, in 20 years, you see clearly that Glefe, the settlement here that is right by the coast of Accra, uh, has densified uh, tremendously. What we can see from the satellite image is the almost complete absence of any sort of public goods from what we can see from the sky, right? We don't see any streets uh, uh, happening uh, during the development, and actually, if we look into the data, uh, later on, we see that there's also absence of sanitation, absence of access to uh, uh, water, electricity, etc., right? Or situations where a lot of the locational characteristics of the settlements are very much under climate threat. Here you have uh, a settlement, you cannot see the, the title, but it's West Point, which is uh, in, uh, um, uh, in Monrovia. Uh, 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 and uh, as you can see in the case of West Point, you have significant coastal erosion. The, the date, if I remember correctly, is from 2000 and let me see the two images 2008 or oh, have it set on 2021 right so you can see a big chunk of the of, of the land here kind of missing and you also can if you if you notice a lot of kind of micro displacements so movements from people who are here going further up uh, uh, to stay there this is a very central location in Monrovia and this is why you know a lot of people decide to weather the situation uh, uh, in this uh, uh, difficult place. And this is a place that was to be relocated. You had about 40 households that move out and then the relocation stopped because they were relocated about 20 kilometers. And so I'm gonna talk in, in kilometers and not miles, but it's about 10 miles. Uh, 10 miles outside of, of the city, right? This is a fish, fishing community too and they were relocated inland. Uh, <clears throat> so, and the practice of evictions, and again, 
uh, this is another settlement that we worked in. Uh, uh, here you see the river and the eviction that ensued on the basis or, or, or rationalizing it as you know, protecting uh, from uh, uh, flooding in, in, the, in the river here. But as we can see, governments are pretty weak in enforcing some of these decisions. So if you see in the other image here, and this is a few years, I can't remember how many years, 2016, 2020, right? We see redensification of the area that was uh, 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 evicted, right? So a practice that is not only unjust and, and creates a lot of difficulty for the households, but also a practice that is very inefficient uh, 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 in terms of uh, resources and the way things are used, right? So why I'm telling you all this? Because a lot of the movements that we tend to see tend to be from rural areas to urban areas. A lot of the movements tend to be quite centered in what we call informal settlements. And informal settlements are, in general, you can call them you know, the poor areas of African cities. In these poor neighborhoods of African cities is where the majority of urbanites are living. So all, all of the cities that I showed you earlier, that, so we did this in Accra, Dar es Salaam, uh, and a few other places. Uh, 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 we have the share, as much as we know, because the statistics are not uh, very good, the share of people living in the informal uh, uh, in informal settlements is either half or a little bit above uh, fifty percent. Right, so more than half of the people are living in conditions that are pretty similar to what you've seen uh, over there. And while at the regional level, again, we see a lot of uh, 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 efforts uh, that both recognize climate change as a driver, but also recognize the idea that free movement is very important. So we have the agenda. 2063 in Africa, the, uh, very importantly, the free movement protocol, the gradual removal of obstacles to the free removal of persons, right? What I, as I said earlier, what we see in cities is not what, uh, 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 not a practice, if you want, of this approach of, of, of mobility, right? A, a limited trust, so, so one of the questions that we ask is what happens uh, um, after a, 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 an environmental event that, that, that can be detrimental, so flooding or cyclone, uh, what is the response from the government? A lot of the people uh, mistrust the government coming in also to provide assistance because they might have already pretty bad relationships due to the eviction practices that we were talking earlier, and very limited targeted assistance in these areas. These areas are considered informal. Often they are not, uh, they don't figure in official statistics because the, you know, the census doesn't necessarily recognize these areas as present, do, want, do not want to recognize them, because that would imply also certain rights that the people uh, uh, should be getting in these places, right? So what was interesting about the, the, the specific research that I'm, I'm talking to you about is that we did this together with community organizations that have, uh, um, uh, if you want, a long history in creating data in these informal settlements. They use this data for advocacy, but they're quite good at bringing the sort of information, and they have become increasingly proficient at, uh, a, 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 at administering kind of questionnaires and, 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 and creating focus group discussions uh, a, a, that, a, in some cases, I think, remove some of the sort of bias that you would imagine if you had someone from the government coming in and asking uh, these sort of questions. We developed a questionnaire together uh, that tried to understand a little bit more household characteristics, migration uh, pathways, and also uh, a, 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 some of the issues that people might be facing in the, what we called, at least initially, the places of destination where people would go. Uh, the things that, these are the, the places where uh, uh, we worked in uh, and, and our partner institutions. Uh, this is a little bit about the model. I'm not going to talk uh, too much about this. So we have like a, a series of different data, right? One that can can be more considered as macro, analytical, and more experiential based on qualitative findings from uh, 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 the interviews that we did in the questionnaire that we have. So we found that these are the hotspots. When we talk about climate migration, a lot of the in-migration hotspots tend to be these poor neighborhoods in these cities, right? Uh, we also found that the life of migrants and hosts, actually, if you compare the two groups, and we can compare in our data sets the two groups, uh, 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 are uh, both facing, in parallel, in a sense, immobility, right? So uh, during a very difficult event, they're stuck 
in, in a specific settlement without having the ability to move out of danger necessarily, and recurring mobility due to what we can call compounding environmental risks that are also affecting other sorts of risks that people might be facing, right? So uh, to put it very simply, the lack of infrastructure, the, 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 the poor conditions of housing uh, is uh, creating a cycle, if you want, of risk when you have, uh, let's say, the, the, the rainy season hitting uh, some of these areas and flooding being uh, uh, the important. We also saw diverse movements in terms of time and distance. A lot of the movements tend to be within kind of greater metropolitan areas, so it's not necessarily the classical story of someone from the village coming to uh, uh, the city, but it's someone from the periphery or from peripheral communities within a, a, a major city going to uh, uh, the urban area. When we ask people, and we ask people a very simple question, why did you move here, right? Uh, very few people directly would give a reason that would be environmental, right? But of course, it's much more complex than that. And once we start thinking, you know, the usual reasons would be economic and social reasons. A lot of women specifically mentioned marriage as a main reason, which, again, in this context can be understood both as a social and economic uh, 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 in some way. But when we started asking and providing kind of some more context about environmental events, uh, about 7% of, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, of our respondents uh, uh, included environmental reasons in one of the reasons that they named them. Right? So we didn't ask for one reason only, but then we said a set of reasons based on what they thought this uh, uh, would be. Uh, <coughs> Uh, this is a little bit what we have found, a very strong prominence of the social reasons, again, because predominantly of marriage. Uh, about 60% of our sample were, uh, 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 were women. Uh, a, in terms of experiential information, we asked them about the sort of damages that they get, uh, uh, particularly during the rainy season. And uh, uh, this is some of the responses uh, that, 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 that we got. What is interesting here is that a lot of this has been normalized by the population. And when we, you talk to them, they tell you this is what happens in the rainy season. It's normal for us to move a little bit, to go out of our, uh, our house. So they have accepted, in a sense, uh, 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 that this is part of uh, uh, urban life uh, uh, in this context, right? And this is gonna, you know, a graphic way. I worked on this with a, with a uh, Parsons research assistant, so the, the graphic looks quite uh, nice in terms of the design. <laughs> but it, it, it's one way to kind of showcase this idea of cascading uh, uh, is the effect that, that might lead to mobility or immobility uh, in different contexts, right? So how sanitation might create additional health expenses, how during the rainy season sanitation conditions tend to deteriorate further, uh, uh, and, and how because of infrastructural damage, you might, uh, people might experience also uh, uh, reductions in disposable Right. Part of the experiential information is also to, to, to get kind of photo photographic material. Every survey that they've done, we took a picture of the dwelling of the person who responded to try and understand also uh, and, and capture a little bit what is happening uh, uh, in terms of uh, levels of immobility or, or damages that uh, the population might be uh, uh, experiencing. And in terms of our findings, what we found was that mobility can end uh, with migrants finding themselves in conditions, conditions of significant marginalization. So again, within the climate migration literature, there's a strong, uh, a, 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 you know, discourse that, that discusses, that, that you know, kind of looks at migration as a, an adaptation process, but what we found was a lot of maladaptation. People moving, not necessarily because of environmental risk, but arriving in places that are under more environmental risk. Uh, the lack of physical and social and financial capital does not leave many options beyond these informal settlements. These are the poor neighborhoods, and actually not so poor. Some of the famous uh, uh, areas there are quite expensive and unaffordable uh, to rent. Uh, and then, uh, and this leads us to think about, you know, the, the adaptation outcomes of, of, of migration. But I think what is also, uh, uh, interesting is that a lot of the people mentioned that they feel that they belong in this area, that they would like to be in this area. We asked a hypothetical question and about half of them said they would like to stay where they are, uh, about a 45% they would like to move. Interestingly, both groups that we asked said that the main focus should be basic services. I think this is very important, particularly for the African 
uh, we're going to be talking about very basic things here, such as sanitation, water, right? Uh, um, uh, and I, I want to conclude with a few uh, recommendations. We tend to see, or we tend to think about the climate migration story as something that has a very strong rural component because of the way we uh, 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 model this as a series of agricultural shocks that might create uh, certain movements, right? But increasingly, particularly in areas that are urbanizing rapidly, uh, uh, there is a very strong urban dimension uh, 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 into the story, right? This has some positive effects. The, the positive effects are that uh, some of the measures that could address uh, the issue of climate migration have nothing to do with climate migration necessarily, but are measures of kind of ways to reduce urban poverty. I'm not saying that this is simple, this is quite complicated, and ways to service and address urbanization patterns uh, uh, in, uh, um, uh, in these rapidly growing cities, right? The reason why we involve civil society organizations is because it's really difficult to understand and get a, a data from uh, uh, these specific areas. So the conditions are really idiosyncratic. We don't have contractual agreements. It's usually handshake agreements that people make. Uh, uh, you have almost complete uh, absence of, of the public sector. Uh, so the, the best way to try and understand a little bit more what is happening in this neighborhood is really to try and reach out to the people working in this neighborhood rather than relying solely on, on, on the official statistics. Uh, so a, couple, a few no-brainers, no to me at least, of what can be done, right? The idea of targeting assistance in these neighborhoods makes sense because we know that these are the neighborhoods that are growing, right? So thinking about how do we improve living conditions might also affect the sort of migration patterns that, that we see, you know? So for instance, you we might see a reduction in, in, in circular migration if conditions in the urban areas might uh, uh, be a little bit better. Uh, then uh, we have a long history knowing uh, about cities of some very basic citywide approaches that, that can work, right? We know from uh, empirical and historical evidence that cities are growing faster in, uh, uh, in area than in population, right? Uh, uh, you know, we're sitting here in, in what is, what was uh, the commissioner's plan about the expansion of Manhattan, right? This expanded the area of Manhattan about 20-fold historically, like the size of Manhattan, right? I don't think we should be thinking about this, but we should be thinking about the expansion of cities because a lot of the climate migration that is projected in the future tends to be in peripheral areas, right? So we don't want to see uh, settlements that are unserviced in the periphery of cities, and it's very hard to try and service and provide services once people have come in, right? It's much easier to say, okay, what would be a basic plan? What is possible to get in, in terms of land? And how we provide at least the, 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 the minimum conditions. So when people are here, we're able to provide the sort of infrastructure that's necessary. I'm talking about such things such as arterial roads, uh, uh, you know, network infrastructure, which is very much out of the right? and, and then uh, from, from, you know, a more, uh, uh, let's say conceptual perspective, and, and I guess Alex is going to speak much more uh, into this, uh, is how do we think about this sort of development or, or uh, adaptation, if you want, to climate from the perspective of non-displacements? Uh, 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 so how do we try to create more choices to the people in terms of whether they can stay or they, they have to move, right? So how, w how we center this around the idea that it's uh, 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 people's choices and how we provide this in, 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 in a way that, that makes some of the policy uh, uh, processes a, a, a more, in, in a sense, democratic in terms of the decisions, right? So how we can think about solutions to displacement when this displacement might be inevitable, how we design this sort of relocation together with the communities, how we select areas that might have uh, uh, or might make sense for them uh, not only from uh, 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 the perspective of uh, environmental protection, but also from the perspective of kind of growing opportunities, which is one of the main reasons why uh, people might be uh, uh, to cities, right? A lot of this, I don't think, has to do with, with technologies that are not there. Uh, you know, the question of sanitation is, is, is something that, uh, 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 or it's a technology that we know uh, uh, and we have applied for two centuries now. So, and the reason why 
you know, the thinking man here uh, says, are we going to invent a anything as, as useful again? Is because the health benefits from indoor sanitation recently were voted by the readers of the British Medical Journal as the biggest health innovations of the past 300 years, more than vaccines and things like that. Again, I don't think this is a, a, a question of a technology, and I don't think also it's only a question of toilets. I think it's, it, it goes into questions of justice, it, co it goes into questions of uh, 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 citizenship in many ways, uh, and cultural rights and things like that. So there's a lot of symbolic repercussions around uh, a lot of the development. And finally, you know, we're starting with some minutes to file the, the, the minimum objections to the, the Open Economic Department. We're starting to think uh, of ways to quantify some of these things a little bit more using kind of larger models, right? So to try and see uh, 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 what are the overlaps between informal settlement and uh, climate migration, what are some of the intersections. But importantly, what, what, how can we simulate some of the changes and how these uh, simulation of the changes, right? So in, 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 in providing uh, 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 through certain policies uh, a, a more sustainable pathways to development for the settlement, right? A, a how this can, can, can be one of the most important, I think, investments uh, in terms of climate adaptation uh, uh, in the future. So to put it very bluntly, uh, I, I do think that, you know, if we manage to address the formality and the informal living in this city in a sustainable way, not necessarily by doing what we did historically here, but by thinking about how do we innovate in terms of built uh, 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 an environment, a, a, a I think we, we, you know, we're going to be able to, ad to address a, a, a significant part of what is necessary in terms of policy actions uh, uh, um, to create, um, you know, better conditions for, for all of the, you know, for the people that I'm talking about, which, by the way, by the end of the century, we'll be talking about, you know, 30%. Of, uh, uh, of humanity, uh, if you look at the demographic uh, projection. So I'm going to stop here, and Alex, Um, a couple of things um, to draw from, to, to underline about uh, Achilles' uh, presentation here from the folks who think about climate migration is that the numbers are significant. They're projected to be very, very large. But they're also probably manageable if we have in place um, some proper structures, um, for both at the global uh, and regional level, norms and institutions that can handle the numbers. Um, what, what, what Achilles said about the growth of uh, African cities, you know, think about it, a, a billion people in the next 20 years, um, but really only maybe 10, 15 percent of that due to climate, uh, climate change. In terms of, although, as he said, it's very hard to know um, the motivations for why uh, people leave. But climate is clearly a factor, but it's not the overwhelming factor, just natural growth in cities as well as the usual movement um, from rural to urban areas. And, and then thirdly, um, uh, although we who think about migration tend to always think about movers, um, in the climate area, it may well be the people who can't move who are the most hurt, the people who lack resources um, to, uh, to be able um, to move, and will just simply suffer the impacts of higher water or, or higher heat um, where they're currently um, living. You know, the press on this, I'm sure you've seen in Achilles, first uh, number that was floated, what, 20 years ago, a billion people would be moving because of climate change. And the, you know, the, the, all the flags, were the, the lights went on in, uh, um, the, the panic lights went on in Europe. Oh, they're all going to be coming to Europe. Um, and, and the data really shows uh, to the contrary, that the, 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 the major movement, as Achilles said, um, will be internal, will largely be to cities. And in fact, um, the, the, the modeling that's been done on this is that the, the migration to Europe will actually decrease uh, because, the, because of people who will not have the resources um, to be able um, uh, to move. So, so, so um, we have to put in context these sort of 
dramatic expressions and concerns and fears about migration without losing the points that Achilles also raises about this will have significant impacts in urban areas. And we need to think, think, about, think about this perhaps from an urban planning perspective more than from a migration perspective. So it's pushing people to think about migration to think in new ways. And I want to take that a little further and say the, the, the climate migration paradigm or the, the way we're thinking about climate migration in fact is significantly different than the way we think about refugee movement in general um, and I want to draw some of those contrasts it, again the the early the early line on this uh, a decade or so ago was all these people are going to move and they're all climate refugees right I'm sure you've heard that phrase or like climate refugees it even applied to people who fled um, after the uh, after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans uh, Americans were called the first climate refugees, and, and the people who left didn't like being called refugees. They said we're citizens of the United States. We're not refugees, and that goes to other language, other things to think about about how we use the word um, uh, refugee. But it's important um, for from a legal perspective um, to think about the definition of refugee and how it differs from how we how people will be moving because of uh, climate because it has an impact then on international norms and international institutions. So let me spend just a few minutes on that. Excuse me for a little uh, dipping here into international law, but it, perhaps it'll be of interest. The, the definition of refugee in international law, which has been adopted into most of the uh, domestic systems uh, of the states of the world, uh, is a refugee is someone who has crossed an international border. And they have a fear of returning home because they fear persecution and then it has to be persecution on one of a particular ground. They, they feel they'd be persecuted based on their political opinion or their um, nationality, their religion, um, their membership in a particular social group. Um, uh, and unless you can show that you're, you come within one of those categories, um, you won't be thought to be a, a, a refugee in, in the international a world, and as I said, in the laws of, of most states. So someone, an asylum seeker who comes to the United States and claims asylum is judged by that standard. And it's a difficult test. They've got to show they've left their country for a particular reason, and they fear persecution on that ground um, if, they are, uh, if they're returned home. You can immediately see, based on what Achilles has said, um, the, the ways this doesn't map onto people who move because of climate and why the phrase climate refugees as a legal and really as a policy matter is misapplied. Again, the, the vast majority of people moving because of climate will not cross a border. Um, for refugee scholars and lawyers and advocates, we tend to focus on the folks outside their country because that's what we're used to thinking about. But that misses a huge percentage of the people who will actually be forced to move because of climate. They won't cross a the border. They won't come within the definition. Secondly, they're not leaving because of persecution on a particular ground or aspect of themselves, nor are they fearing persecution if they return. They're, they've left because their livelihoods have been undermined or destroyed. They can't, their, their family's been scattered. They can't live comfortably or perhaps at all um, where they are. But the international system, the international legal system, doesn't have a general category of people who've been forced from their homes and can't go back because it would be unsafe if they, if they were to do so. You might think that'd be a perfectly reasonable kind of international norm to have, that we would extend protection excuse me, to all those people, but we don't. We have a system, a refugee system, that grew out of the, um, the World War II situation directed at a particular uh, kind of um, set of facts of fear of persecution, uh, and that's what we tend to focus on. Because the refugee world takes people outside their country of origin and asks the question, is it, uh, will they face persecution if they return? There's very little work done on the root causes of flight in a refugee system. So you might say, well, refugees flee because, in the classic definition of refugee, because of a um, because they're a persecuted minority, because of a civil war that's forcing them out, and perhaps we should be working on those causes, what are called root causes uh, of that flight. Um, very hard to do in the refugee world um, because these situations of violence and civil conflict, um, revolution, whatever, are very hard for international communities to, to prevent or to end. 
if you think about the conflicts around the world currently raging today or in the recent past, the international community has has been has done very has had almost no ability to stop them. Um, so that leads to a focus when we talk about sort of classic refugees on how we can handle people once they've fled. How do we take care of them in the in the countries in which they fled? What rights should they have there? Can they attain citizenship? Should they be resettled elsewhere? But for climate migrants, we really can begin to talk about adaptation, mitigation, resilience at home, and that gets to the, the last uh, bullets on, on Achilles' list uh, on the previous slide um, about how do we help people remain who want to stay um, if we can build them uh, houses that can withstand um, uh, big storms, or if we can put houses on stilts or move people slightly so they can withstand sea level rise, or, or if we can come up with uh, irrigation in areas exerting, uh, witnessing desertification. There really are steps that, or if we can develop um, uh, better crops uh, that can withstand higher temperatures. There really are adaptation measures that can be adopted. So in the climate migration area, we are likely to be much more focused on adaptation, and then also Hopefully, mitigation as well as the big, the big thing that can help people uh, um, uh, stay home. Um, and so the focus becomes on helping people stay home rather than helping people who have been forced to flee uh, across the borders. The, the other way that um, climate migration is, is, um, differs from the general refugee um, model um, is that we are also beginning to talk about accountability. Willie mentioned this in his opening remarks about the creation of a loss and damage fund. This is, you may know, in the, in the, in the climate world, loss and damage was the way that, uh, basically talking about reparations, I guess is how we would talk about it in normal language. Um, people who've been harmed because of the actions of others, they haven't been responsible for the harm. And we know that the, the, the developed Western world, global north, has imposed tremendous costs primarily on the global south. It did very little. Uh, to cause um, the problem. And so there's this been demand forever uh, for the polluter pays principle, for people to compensate the, the folks who benefited from CO2 emissions for years to pay the folks who are now being hurt. It seems like a very simple, the most simple notion of justice. Um, and it's slowly gaining purchase uh, in the climate area through the creation of a loss and damage uh, fund, which will really set it's, it's been funded at 20 or 30 billion. We'll see if the money actually shows up, it, these funds tend to get announced in the climate world and then the money dribbles in if, if at all. But, and even the 20 or 30 billion is just a drop in the bucket for what's needed for the people who've actually been uh, harmed. Now, um, the, the question for the people working on climate migration is, can that loss and damage fund be opened up for where the loss and damage is due to, is occurred because they were forced from their homes? So the, the, the migration folks who've been working on climate migration, trying to move their way into the climate world, these are very separate buckets, I'll talk about that in a moment, um, to say, hey, as you think about um, reparations as loss and damage, think about the migrants here, not just the people who, the infrastructure that's been destroyed, the people's livelihoods that have been destroyed um, where they are. So for all these kinds of reasons, the climate refugee um, language, which is very dramatic, and people immediately get it and want to say, we need to do something about climate refugees, doesn't work um, and is actually not helpful in thinking about how we can work on the problem uh, of climate migration. So then you say, well, maybe there's some other legal norms out there, some other institutions that could help us out. And there are some things, and I won't, there's a lot to, I won't bore you with here on, on possible conventions and customary international law, other things that might might apply. The one thing I will mention here is the, the role of human rights. Um, the, the, the human rights bodies and the UN High Commission of Human Rights and other human, human rights organizations um, have obviously talked about how the climate change has a dramatic impact on the uh, enjoyment of human rights. Uh, and for climate uh, migrants in particular, if they've been forced from their home when they're living in places where in the peripheral areas of cities where basic services aren't provided, where their physical security can't be guaranteed and the like, there, there are obvious human rights um, implications. The one way this is being um, beginning now to be thought about as a legal norm that might have some bite is can one make a claim uh, under human rights law that um, 
nobody should be returned to conditions where their human rights will be violated. As I said a, a moment ago, there is no general norm like that. There's no general norm saying if you've been forced into your home, um, you have a right not to be returned if it's not safe. And people are now beginning to think, can we create that, not through refugee law, but rather through human rights law that focuses on the harms that might happen to you um, if you're forced home. And there's some interesting cases that are that are just beginning at this level. Um, the problem in the at the global level, um, in thinking about um, uh, an overall approach to um, climate migration, is that it's it's being sort of fought over in typical turf ways, or maybe better to say there there are a number of different buckets that it's analyzed within without it coming together in a central uh, focus for the international community. So I've mentioned uh, on the climate side, the folks who are now in Dubai are talking about loss and damage, which may have an impact on the climate migrants. <coughs> and the UNFCCC formed a task force on, uh, on displacement uh, a number of years ago to think about migration, uh, forced migration as an aspect of climate action. Um, on the, again, the migration side, there's the universe, uh, Office of the um, UN High Commissioner for Refugees that says, well, climate folks don't really fit into the refugee uh, definition, but maybe we should be trying to help people who've been forced across a border. Um, the development agencies have a big, a big piece of this um, in, in terms of, um, uh, we heard from the, uh, the, the, the Brazilian development uh, agency, but at the global level, the World Bank has now devoted uh, large numbers of resources uh, working on uh, both resilience and adaptation measures, and also working with the Refugee Agency and others on helping people uh, who've been forced to move. And then I mentioned also the development of a human uh, rights approach. So we have all these different ways of thinking about climate migration, but there's no one agency, there's no one convention, there's no international treaty that deals with climate migration the way it does with refugees. And so obviously people have, um, uh, have pushed for uh, creation of something uh, like that, and I can talk about those models if they're of, of interest. Um, let me mention, um, um, beyond climate migration, a, a couple of other ways that law is getting involved uh, in this area, and then um, put to you a few um, suggestions or pleas for, for help uh, for people, the kind of research that will be helpful um, on the policy side as, uh, as we look at it. Um, the, you know, as we think about Dubai, what's going on in COP28 now, we hope that the countries of the world will get together and uh, make decisions that benefit all, and yet we know that uh, the progress on the Paris, um, the Paris numbers have been slow, we're way behind schedule. Why? Because it's against state interest to actually do anything about this problem, and they only, they only move when it's in their self-interest or if they're prodded by a, a political um, uh, forces within their borders uh, and the like. So leaving states to handle this by themselves uh, has proven not to be very successful. Their numbers keep going up. So what kind of strategies can there be? Well, there can be uh, public advocacy strategies and, uh, and protest movements like Greta Thunberg and all the kinds of things you're uh, familiar with in, in virtually every country in the world now. Um, <coughs> um, but the lawyers may also play a role here. I'll put a pitch in as a as a trained lawyer here, that um, there may be actually significant uh, kinds of pressure that can be brought in international courts, regional regional fora, uh, and local courts. And let me just raise a, a, a couple of those, put them on the table here. <coughs> first of all, and I'll, I'll put these into different categories. First of all, they're, they're what I would call uh, mitigation cases. How do you hold states to their Paris numbers, the, what, what they agree to in the Paris um, uh, Accord? Um, and that's been brought in a couple of different ways. There's, uh, so there's a, a case in the, the German Constitutional Court um, where claimants went in uh, to court and said, under German constitutional law, the way that the German government is living up to its obligations or not living up to its obligations uh, to reduce CO2 emissions is um, putting too much emphasis on um, risk reduction and uh, CO2 emission reduction in the future uh, and not in a way that burdens the constitutional rights of young people and generations to come in order to live the lifestyles people want to currently live and have less impact on the future. It was actually put in those terms of, uh, as a constitutional right and the, and the German constitutional court said that's right. 
And what you've come up with as a plan here is unconstitutional. You need to come up with a plan that imposes more costs now and fewer costs uh, in the future, which is pretty dramatic if you think about it, right? I mean, that is a, if you have, um, if you have states with, with those kinds of powerful courts who can order th th uh, governments to do things like that, it, it, can be, um, it can be powerful. There are also um, actions that are now being brought, and we'll see how they proceed, against private polluters, against the big oil companies, the fossil fuel companies. Can you take them into court, in domestic courts, and sue them for trillions of dollars for the harms they've caused around the world? Very difficult questions about jurisdiction and the reach of the courts and what kind of violation is this and did they know what they were doing was harmful, all the kinds of things we've seen in imagine the litigation over other kinds of industrial hazards like asbestos and cigarettes and, and the like. But, but these kinds of cases will continue and I think have a chance of putting pressure and maybe even succeeding uh, in important uh, ways. Um, uh, there are also cases being brought before international human rights tribunals. Um, we don't have an international human rights court. There's a regional court in, in in, in Latin America, there's one in, in Africa, there's one in, in Europe. The European case law is the most um, strongly developed. Uh, at the international level, what, what we have are committees um, established under international covenants that review the actions of parties that have joined those covenants, those, those international treaties. And so people are beginning to bring cases now before those bodies who can issue opinions that aren't are hard to enforce against the offending states, but nonetheless, they, they say important things. And I'll just uh, mention one here. There's a case brought um, by um, indigenous uh, uh, peoples in, in Australia, in the northern coast of Australia, in the Torres Strait uh, area, saying that the failure of Australia um, to, uh, to undertake appropriate adaptation measures has led to the destruction of their land and, and, and their cultural heritage because it has flooded cemeteries, it's made land uninhabitable, and this is a violation of their cultural rights under international, um, under international law, under international human rights uh, convention. And it was brought to this committee under the convention that makes decisions, and they said, yes, in fact, Australia has violated international law here and, and called on Australia to adopt measures to compensate people for the loss and also to take adaptation measures. Now, we'll have to see how Australia responds, but most states will do something to respond um, to decisions um, to decisions like that. Uh, and so we have, and again, it's another um, possible way that the law here can come in as a form of climate action. I think this is really, I think these kinds of legal strategies tend to be ignored um, by researchers and scholars um, thinking that, well, it's all going to have to be state action and the like, but actually um, these things can happen. All right, let me just um, close with a couple of uh, thoughts on where um, um, help from economists and other researchers uh, would, be, would be welcome. Um, first, on, on the root causes issue, as Achilles said in the research he's done, it's really hard to tease out why people move. What are the elements of moving? If you ask them, they, as, as he said, it's remarkable you know, that 10% of your respondents sort of mention climate change, even though it's probably a significantly um, higher number. So if there's ways to model that or to know that, to have a sense of why people move, um, that would be helpful. Um, and these are kind of random. These are, not, these are just all different ideas. The second is how to calculate loss and damage. Um, there's actually a pretty large literature now on on economic and non-economic damages, about how we calculate them. Um, but um, we need more, particularly on, on the migration side, about how do we begin to model the loss and damage of people who've been forced to move? How do you, how do you think about not only loss of livelihoods, you can measure what were they earning at home and what can they earn here, but in terms of destruction of community, um, destruction of, of, of a sense of home, how can we begin to talk about those kinds of non economic losses, can we model those things? Because we're going to have to have some formula for distributing, hopefully, what will be eventually be uh, a large fund or putting, putting further demands um, uh, for reparations. This is actually, I've seen this in the philosophical literature. There are interesting discussions about how we think about these losses. But actually, you know, coming up, as I said, some modeling on the, uh, on the economic side would be, would be very uh, important. Um, 
Another area would be thinking about adaptation. So um, in the adaptation literature, it's recognized that migration can be a form of adaptation, right? If you can't help people stay home, uh, they really have to move, uh, then we should be helping them move in a safe way to a safe place. And sometimes this is put in terms of planned relocation. How do we come up with policies that will help people move to places? Sometimes people are forced by the government to move elsewhere and the like. But can we think about ways of, of, of modeling or, or, or studies that would show at what point does it make more sense to um, take adaptation measures at home building infrastructure, whatever it takes, as opposed, or is it more efficient, is it a better decision to actually help people move? I don't, you may know, I don't know of studies that have looked at this yet um, that would try to come up with some way to, to help policymakers say, in which situations should we really be focusing on helping people stay home, and which does it make more sense to help people uh, migrate? And then um, two other, uh, um, I mentioned this issue about uh, harms to future generations. How the heck do we model that? Willie was telling me about changes in the discount rate that have a dramatic impact on calculating uh, future costs. But you know, if, if Greta Thunberg, I mentioned, has brought cases now uh, before uh, under the um, Convention on the Rights of the Child, saying that what we adults are doing um, are having violate kids' uh, uh, human rights because we are imposing costs in the future. There's a case that's been brought um, by young people in Montana, the state of Montana, uh, saying that, that uh, the policies of Montana and the United States are harming their future lives. How do we, we can say that philosophically and conceptually, it's, it seems pretty obvious and interesting claim, but would there be any way to, to model that, to talk about um, how we would trade off um, harms to future generations versus uh, current generations? And maybe this literature exists, and my guess is it does, Will, and you can tell me it does, and I'm unaware of it. But if it could be brought to the, to, the, to the migration folks, it would be really pretty interesting to know. Uh, and then lastly, on urban policies, as Achille said, well, one of the really interesting things here is that, as I said, maybe we should, maybe the, mi the migration people like us should, uh, Achilles has already made this move, maybe migration people like me should stop talking about climate migration and say, look, this is really uh, a situation of uh, developing better urban policies of which we know some people will be climate migrants, and therefore, you know, what kind of policies make sense and what kind of data do we need to make those uh, the smartest kind of policies they can be and, and really shift our focus away from only thinking about people forced in homes and thinking more about uh, where they end up and how they can live better there. Um, let me stop there, and that gives us about 15 minutes for, for questions. That was a wonderful presentation and kind of uh, actually is along the lines of, of things that I am uh, researching and, and studying. Um, I think one thing I like to think about is the humanization. And I think about in the United States, um, people who have been here 10 generations or more, but they're black and they move and owing to many situa situations, and they have a lot of ethnic, uh, economic um, oppression, including homelessness, and places where they're originally from, they're also like not many social services because it's kind of like this, these dehumanized people who are not, who are almost animals are, are gonna get this stuff and we're not gonna give it to them, like in the South. And um, I think about the migrant situation where it's kind of like, we don't want people to move, but a lot of these people have been moved several times. I think about my own self, I'm 14th generation American, and I have been, my family has moved like every 50 years. Then I think about places like Sweden, which has, was like this place that had a lot of social services, et cetera. And it's actually the second most diverse Western state. People don't really realize that um, outside of the United States. Um, and they brought in a lot of adopted a lot of people from the uh, global south, and so now their um, non-white population or global south black population has grown considerably, and now the government has moved far right, um, have cut a lot of policies and things like that. And so, I think about you know that in terms even within Africa and how like within the countries, and I think about 
um, I'll call it the hier hierarchical categorization of people or racism. You might want to call it because people don't like saying that word. Um, but I think about should we be focusing more on that? Because the thing is that, you know, we talk about human rights, we talk about certain things, but if people are not viewed as actual human beings, they feel like, like I, I, I really do feel that Senegal, Ghana, Nigeria, I feel that the West and a lot of corporations just view that as a place to extract from. They don't care what happens to the people. I, I don't know. But it, it, if you look at historical data and you look at the facts where they, you know, they actually used us as tools. Um, <laughs> so I, I, what, what do you think about that regards to actually focusing a little bit more on not so much on the, on the people who are, you know, I guess representatives of, of the West in helping them to be less racist? Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> So, I mean, that's a, you asked a lot of questions there, Lark. Um, let, um, let me, let me address it this way. Um, race is crucial here. Uh, and it goes back to the, you know, the formation of the global capitalist structure that has created the CO2 emissions that have created climate change. So I, I think about this both at the beginning and at the ending that, that, if we think about the capitalist system as a system of racial capitalism that was built in part on slavery, uh, in large part on slavery in the United States, uh, and also in terms of extraction and exploitation in areas, uh, non-white areas, as you've, you've said, if that was a crucial part of the creation of the global system, that then has produced the CO2, and now is having the impact largely on um, people of color around the world with the most significant impacts are, you see it at both ends of the problem, right? And it, be, it immediately becomes a question, climate justice immediately has to be linked with notions of racial justice. Um, and um, that should be a pretty powerful set of political, philosophical arguments. Um, sometimes by extracting all this, um, you know, to, sort of narrow policy questions of interest rates or other things, we, we lose track of that. We don't have to, but we can in our, in our research. Um, uh, and it, it's, I think it really, that has to say front and, front and center. I've noticed this just in first I can say in my own thinking about um, climate justice, that the, putting the word justice in the phrase for me and racial justice as well has dramatically changed the way I've thought about these problems and the kinds of solutions um, that are necessary. That at the global level, when one talks about migration, it's always a question of migration management. How should the states get together, make sure we have orderly flows of people and not too many people go there. Maybe we can come up with distribution systems that say, well, some people should go there and some there and we can handle it, it's manageable if we just do it right. And the global community tends to stop at that. But as soon as you begin to say, there are particular people who've been harmed throughout this process, um, and you begin to talk climate justice, then the kinds of solutions look very different. And then loss and damage and reparations becomes a much bigger part um, of the story from my perspective. So I, I think it's, a, I mean, it, it has to be there in all our work somewhere, or, or as we apply our work to the world, it, it's, it, it, we miss a lot if we don't think about the category of race. Is how I think about it. I mean, I would say it's it's a you know it's about race, but also about mm, the, about class as well, particularly at the city level. Like the, the places that I that I showed uh, earlier on are places where I mean, you can make a pretty good argument that that colonization had a very detrimental effect in the urbanization process and the way cities were organized. That to give an example. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, one of the empirical regularities that we see in cities is that they're very dense in the center and become less dense in the periphery, right? If you look at cities in South Africa, you see the opposite pattern, which is a result of apartheid. Uh, it, the same pattern exists more than 30 years now since the end of apartheid, right? So we need to understand that 
inaction or bad action often is going to deepen inequalities. And once certain policies are gone, that doesn't mean that things go back to normal. They're going to stay uh, for a while like this. So it is a call to action, I think, towards thinking of this from the, the justice perspective. But I think, and, and, and speaking with Tamim and other economists, it's also a, a, a cause to think about that this is kind of like, you know, uh, the economists say that you know, you're never going to find uh, one, one million uh, on the pavement because someone would have picked it up, right? But here, I think this is what is happening a little bit because all these places beyond the, the sort of you know, miserable conditions, they are significant parts of the cities. There's a, a certain GDP that comes out of these places. In some of these famous informal settlements, you might have international relationships with, with the corporations in, in the West doing, you know, in production in, in, in these places. So in a sense, these places are connected, if you want, to, to, to global capitalism and are impacted by global capitalism. I think there's a definitely a justice claim, but there's also a very strong claim to say that if we are serious about climate action, one of the main areas that we need to be addressing is this. Yeah, you know, I, again, one easy way to, th or one easy way that I'm thinking about this is that if one of the policies that we introduce here, in 10 years from now, you're going to be driving a diesel used car that's going to be made of Greece, right? Then you're talking about 1 billion people driving diesel cars, right? Whatever we do, it's not going to have serious effects on the climate. So that's why I think the challenge is how do we explain this to the right here? How we can have this sort of infrastructure that is there in some cases with policy? Excuse me, if you can take the microphone closer. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I think I'm kind of done. So if you could not hear me, then you didn't miss much. <laughs> Actually, I have a question too from the uh, from the online audience. If I, if I can ask a question. Yes, go ahead, please. So uh, this is more direct to to toward you, the dean. Uh, I think it's. Uh, very interesting to approach the question from a legal perspective. Uh, you mentioned it uh, on a on a on a several occasions in your presentation. So we economists, or me as an economist by training, I would come up with an optimal, say, solution. Say, what is the optimal discount rate given certain condition or given certain constraints? But at the end of the day, is can you uh, enforce those policies or optimal policies? And then, as you mentioned, there is a problem of what we call uh, the ability of an institution to impose uh, the, those, uh, those uh, or to implement those policies. And it differs from country to country. Now, the, con the, the question is, it, is climate change a question of national jurisdiction or international jurisdiction? And if, it's a, if we should consider it a, an issue of or a question of international jurisdiction, then how to proceed without infringing sovereignty? Because that's, again, another headache to deal with. And that's probably the reason why in those uh, big conferences or forums, nothing comes out uh, at the end of the day, nothing comes out very uh, uh, bold to, 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 deal with, uh, to deal with the climate change. So that's my, my question. Um, it's a good question. The, I, I think the answer to the sovereignty question, which is always raised, well, one, there's a clear moral answer, right? I mean, like, get over it, you know, uh, if you think in global utilitarian terms or, 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 or value terms, whatever, it's time for people to stop hiding behind sovereignty as a way of denying people's rights. But from the legal perspective, <clears throat> Sovereigns have the ability to bind themselves uh, either by joining international conventions or by adopting constitutions or laws that, that, that bind them. So lawyers can use, so it's the act of sovereignty actually that binds the sovereignty. Um, so for example, in uh, a, a, a Dutch constitutional decision um, where uh, the the Dutch government wasn't living up, it's like the German, it wasn't living up to the Paris uh, limits. 
um, and it, its commitment in Paris. And they went to Dutch court, and 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 the and the Supreme Court ruled um, that the government had made a commitment. Uh, it was binding. It was an act of the government. It had joined the covenant, made the commitment, and made it in law, and, and it had to live up to the commitment. So, so if you can get the states to take the first act of joining a covenant, uh, or joining adopting a law, or having a constitutional provision, then the sovereignty point goes away because they have as an act of sovereignty have bound themselves in a way that when two human beings make a contract, they're giving up their freedom in contracting and that contract can be enforced against them uh, because they've, 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 um, they've agreed to do that. The same thing on, on the human rights side, you, you can bring human rights, so, some courts allow, domestic courts allow human rights claims to be raised in their domestic courts. They will enforce the international human rights in their courts. And you can go into those courts and say, um, this violates human rights on whatever whatever these grounds might be. The lawyers don't have to choose international, local, regional. They'll, they'll go everywhere. I mean, so they'll bring cases before the Committee on the uh, Rights of the Child. They'll bring cases in the Dutch Supreme Court. They'll bring cases in Montana. They'll, they'll go there. And, and there are websites listing hundreds of cases now that have been brought, not just about climate migration, but about mitigation, adaptation, and the like. Um, uh, that's what we do as lawyers. I'm a practicing, I'm a trained lawyer. You know, we try to find the the court, the jurisdiction, the legal norm that allows us to press our case. And there are lots. What I'm trying to say is, there are lots of opportunities to do that, uh, and ways to win despite this general sense of uh, sovereignty, because states have signed on to these agreements that courts are willing to hold them to. Hi, I teach environmental science, and during our discussion on solutions, often, often uh, we bring up the city of Curitiba in Brazil, for especially dealing with its slum issues. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with it. I don't know if it's still being considered a model for development in which they they took the land that was becoming the slums and they. They upscaled it, but they allowed the people to maintain control of their the houses that they were building. Are these being presented as models around the world for especially uh, migrants, or is this just a really nice city in Brazil that uh, people nod at and then go on and do their own things? So there's something that kind of ties a lot of these together, and that's um, what's being called uh, fortress conserva conservation, where the irony is that to, pers uh, to get carbon credits in, in Africa, for instance, the Congo, they preserve land. Uh, and then the NGO, um, like the Conservancy, gets lots of money, but then they drive out indigenous people who may be actually better stewards of the land, and then they bring in ecotourism, which makes money. And I recall back that the IPCC and IPBES uh, biodiversity met and said you should not uh, do something at the ex uh, do something mitigate climate at the expense of biodiversity, and vice versa. Um, the other aspect of this, the Achilles, is the um, the source and the receptor. So the urban city is a receptor. A lot of times when people get displaced, um, for instance, in the United States, there's um, individual neighborhoods in California that are from specific places in Latin America. Um, and the response, I mean, there's the push, as people have been saying, there's not much responsibility on the push part in the adaptation. Uh, and of course, that brings in uh, another area of law of indigenous uh, and indigenous uh, relationship to migration for, for the right to stay, basically is what this meant. Just maybe a few thoughts from each of you. Um, I just have a, a question 
uh, call on your legal expertise as well. Uh, this is part of a section I've been struggling a little bit with in my dissertation. Um, and it links to, you know, just as recently as last week or two weeks ago, this major altercation between the Fed governor and protest uh, climate protesters, where he basically ruled out anything, any policy, monetary policy related to climate. You know, sending everybody go talk to Congress, they're your representatives. My question is, I think we did create institutions to work around issues that tie into climate. Like the IMF, for example, came out of this global conflict and the financial results that came from it. So I've been building a case using precedent, and there is enough to basically support that the IMF is mandated to act on climate through mobilizing of massive resources and using a lot of their credit issuing capacity. But where do you actually compel the IMF or these types of institutions that we created after World War II to actually act? What kind of legal recourse do you have through what kind of agencies or courts? And I'd be very curious to see if you've heard of any kind of basis for that. Thank you. Just very briefly, Go ahead and answer and we'll yeah okay so the the question on curitiba and other models i i it, yeah i mean it's not curitiba only there's a few different cases this has been addressed in successful ways so we know we know that there are good examples i think what is important is to think what is kind of the 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 main quality of these examples what is success in this context and often success had to do with choice People were given certain choices. People were given certain choices to decide whether they want to stay, whether they want to move, what they would like to see. It's about understanding economic behavior. There's very few studies. There's, there's hedonic regressions about housing that try to see what drives the value of, uh, of property. There's very few studies that are done in, in, in informal settlements. But for instance, you know, there's one that shows that just by a small subsidy that changes the flooring, you can have very important effects in the quality of life, right? So it's thinking about choice, thinking about the, the locational choices of people. People are not crazy to go to these places. There's a reason why people are in these places, right? And there's a reason why they sit ev ev through every uh, a, 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 a event. So yeah, I think the good programs are the ones that provide these sort of choices. Uh, very quickly on the, so the greenwashing question, I guess I could call it that. Um, the, I mean, there are, there are ways, as I mentioned, there are cultural rights that are protected under international law where people can bring these kinds of claims. And I think there was also a, a, a suit brought in, in Europe, the, uh, I forget which country, was building uh, wind, um, uh, wind turbines and, and it was um, infringing on indigenous land and, and, and those claims will be brought and litigated. It's possible to raise those kinds of legal claims in some courts. On the IMF, the, I don't know of any lawsuits on the, against the IMF, but that's gonna come from the member states. I mean, the United States exerts tremendous power inside the IMF and as do European states. And that's the only way I think really to get the IMF to change its policies. I don't know of a way to pursue the IMF. Thank you very much. Um, it's uh, it's good to be home, uh, even though only virtually. Uh, what I'm gonna present today is a paper with um, Cecilia Iona Lasinio um, and Benedetta Samoncini. I'm at Regallo uh, from uh, the University of Bari uh, and uh, you know former uh, New School um, alumni. So the title of the presentation is um, uh, Green Investment and Productivity, Main Policy Challenges. Um, and uh, it is essentially an exercise on first measuring green investment at the macroeconomic level, and second, um, looking at the relation between green investment and uh, productivity growth in OECD countries. Um, the, uh, the, the the, the um, unprecedented threat posed by climate change has been mentioned already uh, a few times, and I don't need to stress this uh, more. Um, what is important to, uh, to stress probably is that to uh, mitigate and also to uh, adapt actually to climate change, 
quickly scaling up uh, investment in uh, global investment in technologies related to the energy transition is of substantial relevance. Uh, this is recognized by the IPCC report as well as by uh, international institutions like the IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency. Um, uh, with that, the figures there are that you know, as the IPCC re uh, synthesis report. Um, argues uh, investment, all investment uh, for the 2020, 2030 uh, window um, ought to inc uh, should increase by uh, six times compared to previous level to limit warning in the range of 1.5 degrees as Celsius to two degrees with total mitigation investment. So specifically those investments related to the, to the low carbon transition that will need to increase across all sectors and regions. Uh, and, you know, to be more precise, uh, the uh, IRENA and the Climate Policy uh, uh, Initiative estimate that annual investment in clean technologies must quadruple to remain on track with the 1.5 uh, degree scenario. Uh, so in other terms, what we broadly call green investment needs uh, to, to be substantially scaled up. Uh, for the transition to take place. Um, so with this in mind, uh, the, uh, our paper uh, tries to do two things. The first one is to offer an overview of in green investment definitions and measurement approaches, um, and more specifically to provide a measurable definition of green investment at the macroeconomic, macroeconomic level building a database of 17 OECD countries over the period 2004 to 2020. The second one is, you know, having built this database uh, is to uh, test the effect of scaling up green investment and environmental regulation on productivity. The expected outcomes are essentially two. The first one is that we expect positive productivity gains from green investment because of, you know, green capital deepening, uh, transitioning from brown to green capital would uh, affect, you know, the, the the capital labor ratio in a way that you know uh, leads to positive productivity gains. The second one is that stricter environmental regulation is expected to lead to positive productivity returns through innovation, which is essentially what is uh, known in the in in the literature as the Porter hypothesis from the Porter and Van der Linden paper. Uh, where you know the authors uh, argue that um, if you uh, enforce uh, a stricter environmental regulation, this uh, you know firms, uh, in order to comply with this regulation, will um, will uh, boost their uh, their efforts to you know innovate, and so you know to move beyond the regulation, and this would produce um, uh, positive productivity returns. Um, in general, our idea is uh, to see, you know, uh, economists uh, in general tend to be very focused on trade-offs. Um, so uh, in the past, there, has, there was this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this idea that, um, you know, the green transition, we should do the green transition to save the planet, but not to save the economy in some, respect, in some sense. Uh, our uh, our goal is to prove that you know if you scale up green investment, you you not you you do not do not only mitigate um, uh, climate change, but you also uh, you also produce you know productivity growth, which is uh, essentially which which is essential for long term growth. Um, well, I'm gonna skip the we conduct a literature review where we distinguish between macro and micro analysis on the relation between green investment, production, productivity, and firms' uh, performances. And also we look at the what the literature has, be, has done on the relation between environmental regulation and productivity. But for the sake of time, I'm going to skip the discussion on the literature. More, uh, uh, more interesting uh, is the uh, definition and measurement of green investment. As we all know, there is no such a thing as, uh, you know, as a clear definition uh, from uh, official statistics about what type of assets can be classified as green. Um, and there's really uh, opinions differ on the extent to which different assets, asset classes can be classified as green. And uh, there is not really clarity about the appropriate metric 
for greenness. I mean, nuclear power in, in this sense is a, is a case in point, uh, but there are, you know, uh, way, uh, there are many, many more examples. Um, in a review article uh, more than 10, 10 years ago, uh, in OECD working paper, Inders and co-authors provide a comprehensive review of concepts and definitions related to green investment, uh, examining green investment by area, so, you know, by, by areas and levels, so at the macroeconomic level, at the microeconomic level, in uh, what's, what are green investments in, uh, as, a, you know, as part of FDIs, patents, and so on and so forth. And uh, by asset classes, distinguishing you know green stocks, green bonds, and alternative investments. So, and you know the the, the conclusion of these uh, you know uh, of their effort to classify and uh, and and, um, and and discuss different green assets is uh, is not really optimistic in a way because they essentially conclude that there is an agreement cannot be found on an all-encompassing definition at all levels and all across uh, different asset classes, but we should look at the def at definitions at specific uh, levels. So what we do is to look at the, at the definition of green investment at the macroeconomic level. Um, we essentially follow the arguably broad definition of, the, of UNEP, according to to which green investment could be defined as an, an expenditure in abutment technologies, including investment in renewable energy and resource efficiency, as well as in natural capital, and also in digital technologies can, that can reduce the carbon intensity of production processes. You know, so this is arguably a very broad definition to pin down, to pin it down a bit more uh, as a measurable definition, uh, we follow the approach of uh, Ero and co-authors at the at, at in an IMF working paper first and uh, in a paper published later. Uh, but you know they they provide a measurable definition of green investment, uh, identifying essentially three main investment components that can be classified as green, that are low emission energy supply. Um, like all uh, investment uh, that involves shifting energy supply from fossil fuels to less polluting alternatives, you know, the, 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 the best example on, on, in this category are renewable energy sources. Um, then energy efficiency that includes all technologies that can reduce the amount of energy required to provide goods and services, uh, such as energy storage. And third, carbon sequestration. That involves halting uh, ongoing deforestation and to capture, uh, you know, essentially to capture carbon. Um, so, you know, in this uh, respect, green invest these three uh, investment components uh, are part of a broader definition uh, that uh, uh, put forward by the authors, according to which green investments are all those uh, investments that can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and are pollutant emissions without significantly reducing the production and consumption of non-energy goods. So, uh, you know, this is uh, the first um, in, in our effort to uh, classify different measurement of green investment. You know, this falls uh, on, you know, the first, uh, the first block. It is also worth mentioning the, uh, the definition uh, and the measurement uh, that was uh, done by the uh, European Investment Bank recently in their latest report, uh, where they uh, uh, put together a variable that they call climate change mitigation investment, that is pretty close to our definition of green investment. Um, that, however, at the, you know, on, the, on a measurement level, as, as, as the problem of being, you know, first, uh, you know, uh, it relies a lot on uh, international energy agency data that are not available, or they're not always available, at, uh, not for all categories. Uh, at, they are not available at the country level, but rather only at the, you know, kind of uh, continental or subcontinental level. And uh, also for some other data, such as, uh, you know, gross fixed capital formation in forestry, as well as uh, some R&D investment in low carbon transition, uh, so these and also climate adaptation investments, these are only available for European countries. 
so we wanted to we wanted to build a database for the OECD, so this didn't serve uh, uh, us well, you know, not, not entirely well. The last uh, measurable definition of green investment is by Batini, uh, by Nicoletta Batini, who, um, and and co-authors in a paper in 2022. Uh, where uh, you know they don't really define green investment; they, they call it green spending. But it, it is essentially estimates on capital spending, so uh, it is you know quite uh, quite quite in line with uh, with with our definition of green green investment. And basically, the authors uh, some uh, uh, estimates on capital spending on uh, renewable energy generation and the overnight construction cost uh, of uh, nuclear plant plants. Um, so, uh, in line with with Ero and uh, and others, we follow uh, well, in following their approach. We also uh, look at the same data set. So we use the the Bloomberg uh, New Energy Finance data uh, to construct our um, our uh, database of green investment first and renewable energy investment later. Uh, so the the Bloomberg data set is probably the most comprehensive. Is the data set that probably uh, provide the most comprehensive information on uh, energy transition expenditures in in the area of renewable energy, energy storage, nuclear power, hydrogen, CCS, uh, electri electrified transport, uh, electrified heat, and sustainable materials. Uh, uh, the problem with the B uh, the BNF data set is that uh, not all data, not all data in these categories in, on the slide, are available for all countries and for a sufficient uh, sufficiently long time series. Um, so you know we we have good data, good data information for OECD countries from 2015 onwards, only at annual frequency um and you know only for you know are not not a long arguably not a very long period of time considering these are all only annual data so we have eight years uh, of uh, of complete information on uh, on on the the main categories of of what we classify as a, as a green investment um so you know we we did the graph here put together uh, uh, our our definition of green investment for uh, the period 2015-2022 in G7 countries where and we see that especially before the pandemic the, the biggest uh, uh, share of total green investment was um, uh, you know was was renewable investment especially solar and and wind um so because of, of this data of the data limitation that i was just mentioning the fact that we only have data at the annual frequency from 2015 2022 the empirical analysis that we conduct in the paper focuses spe specifically on renewable green investment so only on on, uh, on uh, renewable energy sources on investment in renewable energy sources for which uh, the data availability is you know, it's much better. We have data from 2004 to 2023. Um, so, um, so this is the, the time series only for renewable energy, uh, uh, renewable green investment, renewable energy investment, which we use interchangeably. Um, uh, distinguishing between in our data set of 17 OECD countries, we distinguish in this graph uh, between G7 and non-G7. Uh, countries um, and again here we can see that uh, green, renewable green investment is mostly uh, concentrated in G7 countries again spe especially before uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic then after that the situation changes a bit um, if we normalize to, to allow for cross-country uh, comparison we normalize also green investment by uh, total renewable green investment. Sorry, by uh, total gross uh, by, by by gross value added. Uh, so we look at in some sense at the at the renewable investment share, um, and we can see uh, by looking at the 2004 2020 average. So you know in in our entire time span, 
we see uh, that uh, you know some some while well, some countries are above the the the, the, the line, there are there some some countries uh, you know also France that and the U.S. actually uh, quite surprisingly are you know uh, have, are characterized by a fairly low uh, renewable green investment share in in gross value added. The last part uh, uh, that is more the um, more uh, so to speak the, well, the econometric exercise that we conduct is to look at the relation between green investment, specifically renewable green investment, productivity growth, and environmental policy stringency. So uh, the idea here is that um, the that uh, the the relation between uh, Green capital, productivity, uh, and environmental regulation is, uh, 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 for sure, is a complex one. Uh, what we have in mind is that uh, green capital, you know, green capital deepening, uh, will promote productivity growth uh, because you know of a transition towards a, you know, a newer technology. But this does not happen in a vacuum. Uh, the relation between uh, green capital and productivity is, of course, affected by environmental policy and environmental policies uh, that affect the price system uh, uh, that, or that directly support uh, green capital formation and or uh, that they, uh, they affect the regulatory environment. Uh, so uh, in some sense, we this is a, a, the conceptual framework we have in mind. Uh, when looking at the relation between uh, between our variables. So uh, just to sum up, the, uh, the data set that we construct is, uh, is encompasses renewable green investment that we normalize per hour worked uh, to, um, to, to, to estimate our panel as uh, I'll show you soon. Then we have information on labor productivity and capital intensity, uh, GDP per hour work and capital per hour work, respectively. Uh, the, where, uh, and these data are taken from the UCLAMS and Intern Prod database. Uh, and then we complement this information with uh, three with, with uh, the, the environmental policy stringency index um, calculated by the OECD. That is basically a weighted average of three sub indices. Uh, environmental policy stringency index for market policies, for non-market policies, and for technology support policies. Um, so, having said that, uh, we first uh, look, you know, in a stylized way at the relation between, uh, you know, well, just to have a, a screenshot of what this uh, environmental policy stringency index is. So uh, this is an index ranging from zero and 0 0.6, 0 0.6. For all countries, uh, where zero is minimum stringency and 0 0.6 is maximum stringency. Uh, so what we can see is that in the period considered from 2004 to 2020, environmental policy stringency increased everywhere, um, and all countries are now above the line. Second, we can see that there is a positive relation between our measurement of green investment and uh, all uh, measures of uh, uh, environmental policy stringency. And also that there is a positive uh, but not so strong relation between uh, renewable green investment per hour worked and labor productivity. So we econometrically test this relation. Now I don't have time to enter in the details of the estimation, uh, but we essentially estimate a, uh, um, a panel with a country and time fixed effects. Uh, we use both GLS and GMM procedures. Uh, and what we find is that uh, scaling up renewable green investment has a positive and significant effect on productivity growth. Uh, first, second, we uh, the, our results also suggest that strengthening environmental regulations does not hamper productivity growth. Uh, market policies, actually, such as carbon taxes and trading schemes, could uh, lead to to productivity effects that those more are actually negative and statistically significant, but at the same time, non-market policies such as emission limits appear to be more effective uh, in fostering innovation as they have a st uh, stronger positive and statistically significant effect. Um, okay, so you know these are these are our regression results. I 
uh, probably that I don't have time to go through that. So let me just go very quickly to the policy discussion. Um, so, you know, as uh, the empirical analysis suggests that some, some potential policy issues that, uh, might, uh, we, that we might de uh, 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 develop further. First of all, uh, we, sh we show that renewable green investment is a positive and significant effect on productivity growth. So breaking uh, the, the trade-off that I that I was mentioning before. So there are potentially potential synergies between uh, two uh, goals that can be seen as uh, competitive, competing. Uh, so government may decide to pursue climate change mitigation and spur productivity growth at the same time. Um, and uh, um, so, you know, overall scaling up public investment, uh, we don't distinguish between public and private investment, but in, in, in the absence of uh, of a significant scaling up of private investment that we do, we do not see, uh, scaling up public investment uh, could be uh, a solution, but should come together with, a, uh, with better efforts to mobilize private capital. Uh, well, okay, I'm gonna stop here, uh, I also because I think I run a bit over time, and um, thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, thank you for the very interesting presentation. I just had one small clarifying question and I apologize if I missed this, but in the graph you had where you show the different subsector, or it's not subsectors, but the different types of green investment. I'm wondering why you chose to include nuclear. Um, I don't know if you passed it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, well, the, the um, we include nuclear uh, first. You know, this is not included actually in the econometric exercise that uh, that I discussed. Uh, we included all uh, energy sources that were um, part of the of the Bloomberg database. Um, I just you know this is a mere visualization uh, of, uh, of, of 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 the of the database. Uh, but then you know in the, in the rest of the of the analysis we we don't we don't have a nuclear power. Thank you. So one thing I wonder about green investment generally is how, uh, what percentage of total investment it is. Have you seen any good numbers on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and actually, I mean, this is what this graph does. Um, you can see that is, uh, you know, this is only renewable green investment. So it doesn't, uh, co it doesn't encompass any measure of, energy efficiency or other uh, uh, green investment that is you know uh, not renewable i mean this is essentially only solar and wind in, only investment in solar and wind uh, power generation and you can see that for all countries in our data set this is a very small uh, share of of total uh, of, of total gdp or you know actually uh, GBA, gba in in our case so this is 0.4% of GVA, so it is pretty small, but at the same time, the fact that it, the that green invest that the green investment share is small does not necessarily say anything. I think on the effects that these kind of investments can have on productivity, as we we later discuss. And where does this data come from? Uh, Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Thank you. We have one online question. Hi, uh, this is me, I guess you're asking, uh, Nick. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 we can. Yes. Okay. Um, I have a question that is uh, kind of stepping back from, <clears throat> from the details that you gave. Um, you talked about uh, the green transition and mentioning that this can happen without affecting production and consumption. You held up uh, your Bloomberg uh, NEF that included carbon capture and storage. 
I noted that you used a qualifier earlier on that that carbon capture and storage was emphasizing, say, no-till uh, agriculture and and that not not sort of the mineral the mineral versions, which in your other graph show there's actually actually no effect at all from that that technology. Um, but also hydrogen that involves uh, building out lots of infrastructure, pipelines, and so forth. So the, the overall scope here though, is that this green transition is, uh, especially when it comes to incentivizing private investment, without, without looking at the consumption side, there is, um, you're probably familiar with the term Jevons paradox. Um, yeah, I just wanted to get, you know, basically get your thought on Jevons paradox. I mean, one idea of this green transition is that we're just going to do more of the same, have this hugely consumptive Western style lifestyles exported to the world, envied by the world, aspirational to the world, that is regardless of, I mean, it, it, it's impossible really resource wise because the consumptive appetites of the upper one or upper 0.01% of the world is driving, they're, they're narrowing what our options are for even what's available in markets. They're guiding supply chains and, and perpetuating or purveying to the world uh, the sum and bonum, what, what the goal is of economies. And all of our metrics that we use at the macro level, GN, GDP and so forth, are all sort of speak to this sort of hegemonic aspect of our ecologic, you know, deleterious situation. So I wonder if you if you think about this in hegemonic terms about about what about this uh, um, uh, Jevons paradox and whether any of this idea of going you know trying to incentivize private private businesses through investment, which will just mean oh uh, it's more money for me to consume more. I mean, what are your what are your thoughts on? on the hope of this approach yeah well um the my focus has always been also theoretically um in in, in, in my phd thesis that i wrote uh, under Billy's supervision was has always been on the investment side rather than on the on the consumption side so you know i'm probably not very qualified to, to speak on, on this matter but uh, my thoughts would be, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, in especially in advanced countries, uh, in, you know, in high income uh, income countries, there um, there might be uh, a problem with uh, you know with you know Jevons paradox. You increase resource efficiency, you also re increase consumption. Um, there are also might be problems of, of rebound effects, uh, but uh, I believe that you know. Um, um, some sort of regulation can 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 prevent that, and uh, I, I think it sh it it should be put in uh, put in place. Um, uh, I think that with with regulation, I, the, the 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 problem you know of not leaving anything to uh, not leaving everything to the, to the to the to the will of the markets uh, will may will probably you know will not result in any policy failure so we we can avoid the the emergence of of of, of, of these paradoxes in general on um, i still believe that actually some um uh, me, like medium and low income economies uh can have uh, much more to gain from the green transition than than high income economies um so in these cases, I, I, I think that an increase for in their case, I do believe that an increase in resource efficiency should come uh, with an increase in, in aggregate consumption because you know that's uh, that's the right to do so. And if we manage to to do the to the transition quickly, I think that there is also nothing very harmful for the environment either. Thank you. Yes, so I think that's the end of our questions for Dr. Gaio's session. Thank you very much. Uh, Nicoletta Battini, she is uh, uh, in spirit a very uh, um, a person that's close to the new school spirit. 
Uh, Professor Semler, can you put the microphone next to your? Uh... Oh, oh, you can Is this better? <laughs> yes, this is better. Yeah, okay. Then I can take this one. So uh, she um, has two uh, degrees: one from Sant'Anna School of Italy, and some uh, doctor degree from in economics from Oxford University. She taught as a professor in England, and she was advisor also of the Bank of England. Uh, she moved to the IMF in uh, 2003 and uh, is, so to speak, uh, well, uh, what I'm trying to mention, uh, in spirit, very close to the new school type of work that we are doing here. And uh, she is in the uh, Independent Evaluation Committee of the IMF, one of the leading persons there, which is basically ex post evaluating all the IMF actions and research. So kind of a private detective, so to speak, to go in the right direction. But she is uh, one of the very interesting progressive forces. She was one of the first person who wrote a paper about the excessive uh, austerity politics in Europe. So and uh, criticizing this, and I gained a lot from her work there. And she's a specialist also on macroeconomics, uh, finance, uh, monetary policy. She is the advisor to the uh, Italian um, uh, Treasury Department, and uh, is uh, so uh, theoretically as well as in policy terms very well. Uh, equipped to uh, take part in our discussion. In particular, uh, she worked in recent times on um, agriculture, in particular, sustainable agriculture. So not, not all that, I mean, agricultural uh, or corporate agriculture, so with big corporate firms producing in the agricultural sector, but also have some well, the concept of sustainable agriculture, what's good, so to speak, with respect also to climate change and so on. So um, we are very welcome, uh, Nicoletta, now, and you may have maybe half an hour for your presentation. Yes. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, let me get started. Um, thank you so much, really, for your very kind words. Um, I'm now at uh, spending a couple of years at uh, Sverige Street Bank, so I'm calling in from Stockholm. And, um, you know, apologies, Ari, I think I confused the times by, uh, but not really because I'm half an hour late, not an hour late. But anyway, let me get into the um, into the meat of this. Um, as really said, um, as macroeconomists have done several things, but in the last five, six years, I started working on climate and with a particular angle on um, agriculture and food systems and their role in both the climate change and uh, other socio-ecological issues. And so I'd like today to just spend uh, a little bit of time uh, taking you by the hand through what it, what does the food system imply for our climate targets and also what can we do about it from a macroeconomic policy point of view. Um, so here, um, the first thing to say is that, um, you know, it's uh, usually uh, when people talk about climate change and the climate crisis, um, they 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 say that to address it, you know, we basically need to think about uh, addressing the energy part of it. And um, of course, um, there are two big determinants of uh, you know greenhouse gas emissions, and they are energy and food production. And uh, it cannot be argued uh, convincingly that we should focus on one or the other. And I'll show you why. It's really a false dichotomy. We we, uh, we need to address, uh, you know, climate change, 
uh, by moving away from fossil fuels, but we also need at the same time to tackle emissions from global food production. Uh, and besides, global food production uh, causes many, many other human and planetary ills. So it's actually uh, what I call a, a five birds with one stone um, issue. So let's look at the emissions data first. The first thing we need to do to reduce emissions greenhouse gases, of course, is to know where they're coming from to the left hand side uh, chart here, uh, pie chart comes from uh, Climate Watch and the um, World Resource Institute. Your, and basically- uh, Isn't going to the next slide. Uh, did you go to that? This is the, can you see the slide? Uh, we're still looking at the first slide. Uh oh. Okay. That's really weird. I can see the slide here. Hmm. Oh, it might be that the wrong screen is being shared. Maybe you could stop screen sharing and then restart again. Okay. Let me stop sharing. Let's see. Need to go back here. You see this? Yes, thank you. I, okay, hopefully, hopefully it doesn't happen again. So on the left hand side, you see uh, uh, the IPC sectoral definition of GAG contributions, and the IPCC divides it using concepts like energy and you know, agricultural waste industry. Uh, but these um, sectoralizations uh, that may be useful for the apportioning of emissions uh, amounts do not correspond to the way economists uh, you know, partition economic sectors. And that can be very confusing when you come to devising macroeconomic policies. Um, so it seems, of course, this, this this chart gives the impression that all you need to do is to take care of this big red, you know, uh, part here is about three quarters of emissions come from there. But energy enters everything, including agriculture, of course, which is very energy intensive at the moment. Um, and so it, and you cannot really address energy um, easily with just macroeconomic policies because they're they're sectorally meant to. Um, take care of sectors as defined in economics. So if you look at the two bars to the right, you see that um, when you take the food system as a whole, the share um, of global greenhouse gas emissions from the food system is much larger than what appears from the IPCC definition, which is about 18%. And it's been calculated recently that it hovers between a quarter to a third of all emissions. And projections by various uh, experts and, uh, and the Eat Lancet uh, Commission show that these numbers are going to go up to 50% by 2050. So it's a really, really important sector and, and not one that can be taken lightly. I hope if I turn slide now, you can see the next slide. Can you? Uh, we are still on the pie chart. <laughs> it's great. I don't know, I'm, I probably have to go out in again every time. That'd be probably and very annoying. Yeah, sorry. About uh, that. No. no, I'll just skip. To, uh, right. So I might be faster than I thought, and that's good. Um, let me share this again. So, um, yeah, you can actually, um, I hope you see this other chart here. Um, it says food system carbon equivalent budgets. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the, the 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 chart, the bar at the top of this bar chart um, in blue is by Clark and others, 2020. It's a paper in science and it shows um, the, the cumulative greenhouse gas emissions from food production from 2020 to 2100, so the end of the century in a business as usual scenario, uh, based on you know dietary trends and population growth and, and agricultural trends. And basically um, it does show that if we leave things as they are, uh, we will, even if we stop burning fossil fuel today or tomorrow morning, 
we will pass our 1.5 bar and here you have vertical bars um, targets um, and there are probabilities attached to this uh, being staying within this 1.5 targets for um, temperature global temperatures by 2100 we would pass it just with the food system and we would be very short uh, of you know uh, actually passing even the two percent degrees uh, target in Paris and so uh, it, it's impossible to achieve the one five without taking care of uh, what's going on in agriculture uh, do you see this new chart or do I have to go out again yes <laughs> I think perfect. you do okay so maybe I can just keep moving like this instead of doing the full screen that may be um, messing up things uh, so we need to mitigate um, emissions from food systems, and most of the emissions from food systems come from um, animal farming and uh, the crops that are, uh, you know, used uh, for livestock. Because animals, of course, eat each animal, especially large type of animals like, you know, um, um, cows and, uh, you know, even pigs, they consume much more um grains and proteins and um, cereals than, than can feed a person in, in equivalent terms. And so it, it's an inefficient, it's called, it's an inefficiency to eat by eating animals that, you know, consume um, a lot of calories. So if you look at the, you know, at this, this chart here, you can see how land, you know, on earth is divided across different types of, of crops and uh, most of the land, the arable land on the planet is used either to um, breed livestock and, or to raise and grow crops that are used to feed that livestock. And very little or, you know, about a quarter is used for uh, human consumption. In addition to that, uh, a lot of these animals produce greenhouse gases, mostly methane, and that is, you know, it's a very powerful greenhouse gas. So um, we need to change supply because that, that causes a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, but we also need to validate that through a change in diets. And that's the demand side, of course, of um, uh, the, the climate implications of current food systems. And there have been many studies of how to do that, what kind of diet you know, is the most uh, 1.5 compatible and the more we abandon, here's this arrow showing going down, the more we abandon animal food or we diminish, I should say, animal food in diets um, across the globe, uh, the, the more are the increases in potential carbon sequestration from a release back of land that was initially used to grow crops to feed animals, and also a reduction in emissions from food, these are all the methane that is uh, emitted by animals themselves. So um, huge savings in gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year can be made by shifting from current Western diets to uh, other types of diets that use less animal food. Uh, here's a graph that I think it's, it's actually very important because the, the IPCC um, tends to use um, an aggregator for the global warming potential of different greenhouse gases, but greenhouse gases are not all born the same. There's of course CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and they all have different uh, lives in the atmosphere, you know, and uh, half lives. But uh, for IPCC calculations of warming, they are usually um, usually we look at the uh, global warming potential of gases at 100 years. So a bunch of scientists and experts in Oxford have uh, written a paper where they basically uh, recompute, you know, the uh, implications uh, of greenhouse gas emissions and all the projections by accounting for the different half-life of gases uh, and they, the biggest potential. And basically what they have shown is that um, you know if we um, by 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 that standard if we reduce emissions over time in uh, you know CO two and this is the red line here in the top chart to the left 
uh, we will not be able to control and reduce warming on the planet. It will, warming will plateau at a higher level, eventually it will plateau, but it will not be diminished. On the other hand, uh, if uh, we reduce methane, which is one of the main products of uh, animal, uh, animals, animal use for food, we can actually cool the planet because of the, uh, these calculations that they've made. So there is merit in actually proceeding um, fast or uh, at least immediately to a change in, uh, you know, the food systems in the direction that I mentioned, because that is going to buy us time in a schedule to reduce uh, the temperature or at least keep it contained within the 1.5 target that we we have set for ourselves. And and how can we reduce emissions from food? I mean, I mentioned a few things, you know, diets and other things. And, but there have been calculations um, that are more comprehensive. Uh, people talk about uh, crop genetics to you know make a better use of land with, with less resources. So high yields can can reduce you know part of this large cumulative uh, carbon budget from the current food system, which is still replicated here in, the, in gray at the very top of this bar chart. We can halve food waste, which of course we produce a lot of food that we don't eat. You lost your screen again. You have. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Seems like it, there's a connection issue. Yeah. Boop. Let me try again. Uh, uh, there's some connection issues. See now? Yes, we have the screen again. Okay, so these are this is a bar chart that shows how we can reduce emission from foods with different kind of uh, approaches. You know, increase yields using crop genetics, reduce food waste, which of course a third of all food produced on planet is uh, thrown away, or you know perishes in the fields. Uh, bring back uh, healthy calories. So um, about uh, you know twenty percent of people in the world are uh, obese. Of course, the distribution is very different across countries. And then 40% uh, are overweight with countries like the US having up to 40% you know, of people obese. So, um, if we bring back that calories for each person on average on the planet to recommended, WHO recommended calories per day, uh, you know, we can spare a lot of food production, therefore you know, spare a lot of GAGs best farm practice and of course the plant-rich diet that we mentioned before and if we do all these changes we can actually uh, we can, if we were to implement all these changes we would completely annihilate you know the carbon um, emissions equivalent in equivalent terms from uh, food and agriculture we probably make also a little gain in gigaton of uh, carb co2 equivalent over uh, 100 years uh, I hope you can see this next slide. We can. Yeah. And then I'll move straight ahead to this. It's not just emissions. People talk a lot about emissions. And now, you know, there is uh, at least uh, a lot of scientists are, are thinking again, you know, whether we are calculating um, the, well, the, the contribution and um, of, you know, humans to climate change. And um, a lot of people say, well, we are a very small part of the big picture. Um, but in terms of the food systems, what is sure, and this doesn't, you know, uh, require, uh, even without projection, is that the current way we uh, grow food um, is, it ha has and is destroying, uh, you know, our soils, our rainforests, our air, and is polluting our air and water. And um, at the moment, and this is observationally true, about a third of the Earth's soils are degraded. And we know that over 90% could become degraded by 2050, according to the FAO and you know, other entities that studies uh, soil health. Uh, and the equivalent of one soccer field of soil is eroded every five seconds. And the soil is, of course, um, the skin of the earth is, is, is really the frontier between biology and geology. Once that's gone, as we know from, you know, the Dust Bowl or the Roman Empire, uh, you know, uh, population starts suffering in, in, in great ways. So, and it, it's, it takes a very long time to make soil health again. 
So this is very important. Of course, rainforests, which cover a third of the Earth's land, and um, uh, they they have been deforested at very high rates. And uh, the secondary growth rainforests are never like primary growth rainforests. And rainforests are very important for the whole planetary climate, uh, precipitation, and food production as well. And so the destruction of rainforests because of agriculture is, of course, uh, a terrible uh, thing beyond you know the atmospheric uh, release of greenhouse gases. And then there are really strong impacts of current agricultural systems on water and air. And water is renewable but under certain standards, but the way that you know um, um, contaminated water from agricultural fields, both in terms of you know fertilizer, chemicals, but also antibiotics, uh, GMOs. Uh, makes this water non-reusable for human purposes for uh, you know decades sometimes um, you know it could be um, many many decades and and then um, this we can basically consider this water becoming non-renewable uh, for a very long time and that is of course uh, a very damning uh, problem. I just wanted to touch on biodiversity. Biodiversity is uh, is an area that of course I'm very interested in and I know that uh, there's a been talk about that here um, and the role of nature, natural resources, and the um, and natural capital in the computation of, of wealth. Um, food systems are the number one cause of the loss of biodiversity loss. I mean, that's a, that's a fact that nobody questions. I just want to show you this, and that's again due to animal agriculture. We are now left with about 4% of the wildlife that we had, you know, in 1970. Uh, mammals on Earth are mostly animals for, for food, and then us. Um, for example, for the Amazon, uh, about 80% of deforestation is caused by cattle ranching. And, uh, and so the biodiversity loss there is, you know, ascribable in great part to uh, agriculture. Um, if you look at the chart here, just to give you a sense of proportion of biodiversity loss, in the past 400 years, we lost about um, 1,000, I think 800 species. Uh, now we lose yearly, uh, you know, between 5,000, sorry, 8,000 and uh, 54,000 species a year. And that's, of course, a multifold of what's the background rate of so the typical normal natural uh, rate of biodiversity loss in a planet like planet earth and beyond destroying um you know biological diversity our food systems don't even feed people well and here's a chart showing that a lot of well um say this is a, like a few years old but uh of a total here of 7.4 billion people on planet we're now approaching eight or at eight you know, a good third or more are either overweight, underweight, or deficient in main nutrients, obese, and, and of course, a lot of kids are stunted or wasted. So we produce this food, uh, we, uh, we are unable to distribute it well, and it, we trash the planet in the process. And in, uh, throughout our, uh, you know, in various parts of the world, both advanced and emerging and developing economies, we lose and waste a lot of this food too. Uh, so the the food um, that we that we produce is um, produced in a way that is not sustainable. It doesn't reach the right people, and uh, it's um, a lot of it, it wouldn't even have to be produced because it doesn't reach anybody. Now I want to pass very quickly to the economics of of all this um, food system approach that we use across the world. And we know that, uh, you know, it has really large uh, consequences. Um, wrong diets like uh, cause overweight, obesity, and that has massive, uh, of course, health issues, which uh, impact physical houses around the world. Uh, there are zoonoses that are caused by um, the way we do intensive animal agriculture, and that causes antibiotic resistance, which has been calculated will be having a massive impact on global world product uh, comes 2050. Um, it, 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 there's a loss of natural capital and biodiversity loss, which of course can be 
brought back to wealth in terms and GDP. And then, you know, we don't know what's um, now COVID, you know, there's there's evidence it's not really uh, zoonotic, but um, of course, all other things like swine flu, et cetera, have um, avian flu that come from intensive animal culture have massive, um, very large um, impacts on, on GDP in countries, either that are the epicenter of these epidemics or, you know, that have to prepare for a potential uh, pandemic. Other economic aspects of current food systems is that, of course, they, um, the, the, the wrong use of um, the unsustainable uh, agricultural practice in many parts of the world have led to uh, a rush to buy land in other countries that have remained you know, fertile. So we have countries, for example, like China, Saudi Arabia and so forth that have gone out and um, as their use tremendous amount of fertilizers and completely destroy their soils or consume water for urbanization, they've gone out and purchased land, large scale purchases of land in countries that, uh, you know, had still had fertile land, Mo mostly, and uh, that means land in Africa and lands in South America. And uh, usually these large land acquisitions um, have been done in countries that, by the way, um, hadn't, you know, reached a point where they could feed themselves well. So it's, you know, perversely, they and the bad practices in agriculture in countries um, that are ahead in the development scale have made even worse or worse than food security in countries and that were not food secure. And a lot of these acquisitions happen to happen uh, just where there's a, a, the remaining areas of still biodiversity across the globe. So here are blue dots are the heat map of large scale agricultural acquisitions. And to the left, the other hemisphere, you see the in green, the terrestrial diversity concentration across the globe. And you can see that there's a, there's a match basically. Um, the, the misuse of, of resources uh, and the, these large acquisitions across the globe, including by oligarchs on the West and the East, has led to uh, a skyrocketing of farm, farmland values. Um, and here in Dash is the, the global uh, land, farmland value by Seville. And you can see how it grows much more, for example, than, than gold or, you know, notoriously assets that notoriously uh, retain value despite some volatility in, in the short run. And it has led to a huge increase in the food price index. And that is, you know, every is under everybody's eyes when you go to the grocery store and we have this issue. This issue is not new. It came before COVID. It came before Russia, Ukraine, and it's been with us for many years, as you can see from that chart. So what's the role of economic financial policies? I want to spend just a few minutes here. How do we get there? Well, uh, the current food systems around the world are a product of economic policies. Coming out of the Second World War, a lot of countries wanted to retain, you know, the scheme of subsidies and, and tax credits for uh, food security that were adopted during the war. And, uh, and that, of course, had created a lot of vested interest, interest in, in, in various industries and particularly, of course, in the agriculture industry. And here's an example of U.S. agricultural subsidies as a percent of total to grains um, go uh, the large, you know, the lion's share of U.S. agricultural subsidies, and some go to meat and dairy. And these grains are grains shown in the middle chart here, the pie chart, that are mostly go for animal feed. Some go for ethanol and some go for human consumption. Once you apply these kind of schemes in subsidies uh, using economic policy, what you get out on the other end is that, of course, the prices, and here's a distribution by the USDA of food um, energy prices by calorie, uh, the prices of, of meat and grain uh, are much lower than the prices of unsubsidized uh, items, for example, vegetables and fruit here in red and blue. Uh, sorry, in red and green. And what that means is that diets are also skewed uh, to more consumption of, you know, high processed food, meats and, and, and carbs than they should be and, and have been in the past prior to the introduction of these subsidies. So 
just to come to an end here, um, I have identified four policy action areas to get to the 1.5 uh, target, uh, food supply, food demand, food waste, and of course, conservation, because that's the other side of the coin of land use. And um, I have studied uh, with a bunch of other um, experts, the types of economic policy measures in each one of these areas that can be declined and developed to address you know, the, the challenges for sustainability and for uh, socioeconomic uh, prosperity. Uh, for example, in the supply side, you know, one can think of taxes on intensive crop and animal agriculture and fishing. Um, one can redirect subsidies, the ones we saw in the pie charts before, to sustainable farming practices and create credit schemes for regenerative farmers, land regulation um, and giving land back to a lot of indigenous people and, and so forth. I won't go through it all. In demand, you, you know, people talk and a lot of uh, attempts have been made to put taxes on unhealthy foods and subsidies. And uh, we have thought about uh, this quite a bit. And, uh, but these have to be accompanied by transfers to compensate for the loss of purchasing power from these so-called sin taxes on unhealthy foods. And then education reforms, R&D and health tax bonuses and so forth. On waste, you know, public investment in weather systems, cooling systems, storage, training, and in developed economies, uh, regulatory reform on portions, retail education reform. Um, on conservation, well, there's a bunch there of uh, beautiful ideas and things have started to finally roll thanks to the CBD, the Conference of Parties that happened in Canada in 21, um, environmental taxes, um, forest management, mapping, uh, nat natural capital accounting. I think there'll be um, someone talking about it here today. And then land reforms, again, for Indigenous people and tax subsidies reform. Uh, I have, this is the book that I put together in 21, uh, came out and it's a, it's a bunch of uh, contributors and uh, we, we do match, you know, economists and specialists in these four areas, supply, demand, uh, food waste and uh, conservation uh, from academia all over the world. And, and that gives you a very detailed flavor of what economic policies can be thrown at this issue, which is mainly something that um, has been caused by economic policies to begin with. Let me conclude with this slide. My, uh, my view here uh, developed over years and other colleagues is that food systems are broken. I think this is not, not news. I think it's not a secret at this point. But if they redress, they can mitigate emissions. They can reverse warming and they can make the world resilient. Um, there are probably many more than five birds uh, that we can hit with one stone. I calculated that my latest calculation, we can hit nine issues with one stone that is addressing food systems. It's the wrong policy that causes mass, but smart country-specific policies are at hand, and we, we have a list of them, and we show which countries do what already. And innovation is important, but it cannot be left to the private sector. It needs public policy support uh, in, in at various stages of development and all hands on deck. Thank you so much. I stopped sharing here. I hope you can see me and hear me. So I'm using two devices and that may be the issue. If you have any questions. I can see you, thank you so much. I, I, I have ahead. a question, yes. Go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir, yeah. You can go okay. ahead. You, uh, the Spade no speaking, you put a, a, a great deal of emphasis, uh, interesting material on the uh, on, um, shifting pattern of that uh, food consumption as a solution. Uh, now, my question is this, is there any scope in the policies that we discuss for uh, the pattern of uh, food consumption uh, not being as it is, but at least simultaneously uh, finding a solution for a kind of meat consumption without animals? You know, referring to the new emerging technology, which is, you know, the, the, the production of uh, of meat in laboratory conditions and, and so on. Is there any scope in your uh, positive in your uh, 
um, scheme of uh, economic policies for that sort of uh, solution? Any rationale for subsidizing it, for example? Yeah, so uh, the, the, the book has actually uh, this uh, emergent uh, sustainable farming or food production practices, and we do cover with experts, I mean, like leaders in this in these sectors, we do cover that as a possibility. Uh, so this uh, clean meat, also called lab meat, which is basically produced in, in a laboratory, and then you have plant-based meats, which, you know, other types of meats that taste like meat, but of course, the plant-based. Um, I must say that, you know, after years of work in this um, and that there's so many startups and projects that I i am not, I think it, it is a, a solution, a partial solution, but um, it also is now coming, it's now emerging that um, to produce this type of food, First of all, this food is also highly processed, especially plant-based food. So it's unclear how healthy that is. And second, uh, it's, uh, it does require a lot of energy too at the moment. I mean, it hasn't really broken you know, that barrier of energy consumption. So it's unclear what's the net gain from doing things like this. But there, you know, it's, it is promising. Uh, I would, I think the, the best solution, the easiest solution is the most traditional solution. Like we used to eat less meat in the past and more, uh, you know, vegetables and more fruit and, and more grains, whole grains. And I think that's the easier way out, I think, here. And there are lots of countries, if you look at the Eat Lancet, you can actually go on our word in data, you can plot and, and do uh, comparisons of diets across the world. And lots of countries, including China, that you know, where meat is emerging more as a, on the plate and more portion of the plate uh, occupied by animal protein, but it remains very distant from our, for example, you know, US or even European standards. And so I think the solution, maybe we don't even have to rely on this, you know, very biotech, you know, very complicated things which uh, split, you know, proteins and put them back together with color so that it looks like something that we uh, we would like to eat. But we can go back to a, a healthier diet as we used to have, you know, in the maybe 40s and 30s and 50s, uh, or just imitate and import more of other, other types and styles of food from other countries. But there's a huge debate on this. The main thing is that whatever we do must be both sustainable and affordable because, you know, you cannot have um, you know, a, a clean lab burger that at 20 bucks, because you know, then your plan of greening the planet with that is not going to work very well. And two, I think it's very important that it's healthy. And, um, and, and there's a book, if you're interested in this particular aspect, which is called Technically Food. It's basically a scientific journalist that goes and talks to all these startups in the Silicon Valley. And, um, you know, it's, it's a mixed story there. Um, it, it can be of help. I don't think it can be the solution. I think the solution is to redress diets to what what we used to eat, healthy food, you know, raw food, and definitely less animal food. Yes, I mean, thank you. I just mentioned that because, you know, we economists think habits are hard to die. And it's, yeah. it, it's kind of like difficult to go back to the, you know, at least for, for some. But 50s, 60s, I mean, um, China is coming out, uh, meat consumption is increasing uh, uh, massively, it's making a, a great deal of negative impact on, on attempts to you know, undermine the type of policies you're talking about. So I thought in that context, maybe uh, I'd like to wanted to hear your opinion on its uh, yeah. as a future solution. Yeah, as of yet, as of yet, is not uh, at scale, and uh, the price is not uh, right, and the quality is still, uh, I think, a bit of a question mark. So, but uh, you know, I think if people want to help, the the rule of thumb uh, is no animal protein before dinner, and if you do that, it's much better than non flying or non driving or you know. So that's an easy one, and I think we can all do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Go ahead. 
So yeah, so just in response to this uh, uh, um, issue of habits, uh, there is, in my view, I think there is less emphasis in academia, or it is probably just just nascent now that there is should be a focus on circular economy, and uh, it's hard to change habits, but we can also think of ways of systems. Uh, where we can reduce waste, and you talked about how waste can uh, can uh, uh, contribute massively to to uh, to carbon emissions, and uh, so maybe in in academic in academic discourse, models should uh, take into account, uh, or at least what I can observe in literature, in macroeconomics or uh, other economic models, they don't really take into account the, the circular aspect. And maybe in the future that uh, for PhD students to give an emphasis on this, uh, to model uh, economies where uh, we recycle uh, wasted or non-used non goods. And it's probably a bit tricky with food because it's perishable and it's fast, quickly perishable. But that probably requires a well, a different way of thinking, and that's we should, what we that's what we need in, uh, in in academia right now. Yeah, and you know the uh, so at the micro level, there's the business practice, um, but can also become a regulatory uh, kind of approach from governments is to make sure that you know food is not wasted by guiding training and exacting that the industry doesn't you know is not skewed to throwing away uh, products uh, because it's not profitable or less profitable for them to keep them on the shelves so there are, for example supermarkets now i think in the us is started this um various companies are providing dynamic pricing uh consultancy whereby you price things differently depending on the expiration date and uh, that seemed to really have an impact on, you know, the amount of loss or sorry, of waste that supermarkets do and, and a volume, you know, that really makes a big difference. For developing countries, the, the uh, problem with food waste and loss is mostly a loss. So they're, um, you know, battered by uh, weather that they can't forecast very well. And a lot of the loss happens in the field. And because it's badly stored or because there is no storage facilities um, or because it takes too much time to reach ports. And that's more of an infrastructure problem. Uh, but I think I totally agree that, you know, uh, we, we always think about maximizing, you know, profits. And uh, but but in maximizing profits, we don't account well for the costs because these are externalities that nobody takes account of. And if we price them right, then we'll have to enter models. And if the enter models, you know, policies will, I think, be designed in a way that it's it's much more sustainable and, and much more intelligent too. Uh, one question, one question from the audience. Uh, I the you had two charts on your PowerPoint that I thought were very interesting. The first was the trajectory we're on with our current uh, amount of food emissions. Uh, and the next one was how much we could reduce our emissions by if the entire world cut their meat consumption or went vegan. Uh, and I wonder if you could compare the two. Is it is it enough to keep us at one and a half degrees um, or is it not enough? Is it the case that if everyone went vegan, global warming would stop? I, I know it's optimistic, but I, I wonder if you could compare the numbers. So let me go back uh, to the slide. I think you're talking about, uh, let's see. Uh, maybe I can share it again. I don't wanna mess up here. Okay, I think it's this one. Is this one? Yes. Okay. So yeah, so this slide uh, basically says that if we, uh, uh, you know, if we take care of, um, diets, we, we can make a lot of gains in terms of uh, emissions. And this is per year. So the bar charts I was showing at the beginning were cumulative 2020 to 2100. 
Um, but these are really large numbers because at the moment, I think the global emissions yearly is around 36 or 40 uh, gigatons. And so this is, this is pretty large. And, uh, the, and then we need to combine this with the chart, if you remember, about um, different types of greenhouse gases and global warming potentials. Mm -hmm. And I think if we, we don't need to go all the way vegan, but I think if we go even here to less meat or no beef, which is the main culprit really, uh, we, we can gain a tremendous amount of time in reaching the 1.5. Uh, so I think the mantra is, is uh, uh, you know, the, the, the solution here, I mean, this, this, these calculations are important, but they, of course, are very unrealistic. I mean, we can never, we, can, we will never be able to impose veganism on the whole global population, right? So, but but what really matters is that we all across the globe, and there are some big chunks of the global population already do this. So it's mostly the West that we we eat less meat. So it's the average that counts, not who becomes fully vegan, because that will always be a small number. But if we can reduce uh, everybody's meat consumption that will basically bring down the um, the average, and that that will make a huge impact um, on the environment. Uh, we haven't talked much about, for example, um, uh, the the seas. So the book covers uh, also um, not just the land, but also oceans. Um, and you know, it, it's all the Earth is a living organism, and so. Uh, you know, fisheries and how we deal with, you know, conservation of megafauna and, and in, in the in the seas also matters a lot. Um, and I think that um, that also has to be taken in consideration here. It's not just land. This chart is just about land. But I, I think we have to have a, a global approach to the use of and consumption and breeding of animals for food. Because whenever an animal, you know, is bred for food, there's a huge externalities, not just on GAGs, but in a bunch of other things, and um, and that that is potentially, you know, not something that we can we can easily correct. But your point, you know, is how how many people can do we need to to turn vegan? The, here, the calculation is all world goes vegan. So of course that's not you know going to happen in my lifetime. And I think, uh, but I think even if we stop here, these are really large numbers. And then you need to accumulate this by year to see what's the reduction on that um, carbon budget for food system, basically, which is the, the top, the first chart I showed. Great, uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think we need two more questions. Uh, Can I ask something? So many interesting questions, and I see that there are so many hands raised still. Um, maybe you have some way to get the slides and get in correspondence with um, Nicoletta about her wonderful work on uh, agriculture and land. It's so important for the uh, movement. Yeah, well, you can write me in the chat after if you want, and uh, so that uh, this okay. can move on. Because we are focusing a little bit in this uh, workshop also on uh, less uh, uh, well developing economies and low and middle income countries and what um, uh, the climate uh, risk uh, challenging will have for those countries. And so you can correspond then with Nicoletta then later, but we have to move to the next uh, session and we are a little bit uh, disrupted already in terms of time. So, Nicoletta, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. All right. Uh, Julia, you are up next. So if you'd like to begin and then share your screen. Yes. Um, so thank you very much, Professor Willy Samula and Ibram Hari. Uh, Samuel uh, Obusu and uh, Nick Anderson and Eva Conway for hosting this event so nicely. And um, today I would like to share a few thoughts on bringing nature into economics. 
And the topic is on natural resources and climate wealth of nations that are these days brought into national and international accounting. Um, so first of all, let me go back. Uh, there was a time when there was a great plague in the 14th century and uh, at, in the 14th century, about one third of the known population uh, unfortunately died of the great plague. And after uh, the, the great plague, there is a beautiful, there's beautiful data um, and historical uh, economic work uh, on how the Renaissance could only bloom because finance after the great plague actually uh, became in the service of, of uh, human beings and in the service of society. We saw with the Florence city state, uh, the Italian Medici, for instance, or the German Fuga family uh, brought uh, social equality into finance. Um, but we also saw expeditions of the Spanish crown that really pushed uh, forward uh, innovation and uh, science. And uh, these days also after COVID-19, there's this uh, idea historically that we live in a time of the great reset. And what that means is uh, that uh, currently also there's this idea that finance has come uh, again back in the service of people. We have, for instance, in the US, the Green New Deal, uh, which uh, is, uh, is running under the headline of funding the future. And it's uh, a seven to 93 trillion US dollars uh, package uh, that uh, is, is uh, started uh, before COVID, but then really after COVID, uh, President Biden uh, really uh, made this into his economic legacy and, and tackles climate change uh, inequality uh, alleviation. On the European side, we have the European Green Deal that uh, is also funded by 1.8 trillion euros. So these are the, the largest uh, budgets ever that were uh, really placed into the service of people. And in Europe, we also have the sustainable finance taxonomy, which tries to measure the ecological impact of industries. And on the international level, you can say that uh, transition funds uh, in order to alleviate uh, inequalities that come from external environmental conditions. So for instance, climate change and the diverse impact of climate change has become more and more an issue on the agenda of, of uh, international global governance executives. We also have this idea of the global Green New Deal and that really is, uh, is ties back to, to work that Professor Semler is doing for I think more than a decade by now on climate bonds and, and uh, taxation strategies. I will speak more about this in the in the uh, later part of the presentation. And then, of course, the United Nations with the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we we uh, all know this. So um, today I want to uh, introduce a, a bit uh, of ideas that I got exposed uh, in the last one and a half years. Um, so, so I was doing an academic training with the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis in the US. And uh, there we gathered data um, and, and information on this new idea in the US uh, on bringing nature into economics. In the U.S. White House, there are, there are papers uh, out, so you can, you can find the, the papers online, is uh, rolling out this uh, initiative um, to bring nature into accounting, to integrate natural resources uh, into national accounting. So for one, account for natural assets like land, water, minerals, animals, and plants. And we have to say that the Environmental Protection Agency actually was founded based on this idea to account for nature in, uh, in a public policy. So that was the first idea why the Environmental Protection Agency was uh, initially set up. And now we have this uh, new strategy of the White House thinking about, uh, about how to bring in nature into economics and natural uh, capitals role should be also shown over time how that can steer economic growth and i really enjoyed uh, uh previous presentations that really made uh, this also brought this to life uh in uh in real data and also future accounting under uh discounting under climate change and uh resource depletion is on the agenda 
So the strategy is, is huge. Um, so one of the ideas is to bring really statistics uh, into environmental economic decision making. And it's a federal strategy uh, for capital accounting, competitiveness, but also making sense of data. That was one of the big uh, issues in the National Academy of Sciences, actually. Uh, that that uh, we we currently are hoarding data, and in the U.S., I think in Virginia, uh, huge data centers are actually set up. It's, it's sold that data is stored in clouds, but it's actually uh, physical data centers that have to be uh, cooled uh, by by energy and are actually energy uh, if very inefficient. Um, but what do we do with all this data? And there's the currently this drive in the National Academy to really make sense of data and, and also make it more uh, energy efficient to not collect all the data, or if we collect all the data, then to immediately make sense of it and then store it uh, more efficiently. Um, yeah, and then on the on the local and state level, there's definitely more going on on resilience than ever before and conservation, uh, also really working with the local communities and really integrating people on the ground uh, in order to make sense of the collective. And uh, it's a huge strategy of the US. By now, uh, I think 27 US federal departments and agencies are involved, so it's, it's massive. And the flagship agencies are the White House Office of Science and Technology, the Office of Management and Budget, and the US Department of uh, Commerce. In Europe, uh, we have this European Green Deal and the Sustainable Finance Taxonomy, and this was this idea to classify economic uh, activities contributing to environmental objectives. Uh, there, there is also this drive of really uh, trying to make uh, sustainable finance and, and the entire ESG ratings uh, more transparent, have more clarity, more integrity in it. So this is this keyword of greenwashing that, that we really shine a light on how ESG is practiced um, and really uh, also think about uh, industry standards, lift them up uh, in transparency and, and financing sustainable growth uh, in the finance sector as well. Uh, similar attempts are also uh, currently undergoing with uh, with Gary Gensler in the Securities and Exchange Commission in the US. And then um, on the international level, so where this extrapolates on really measuring nature in, uh, in uh, the international accounting, there's this World Bank Changing Wealth of Nations project that measures uh, how rich uh, or how wealthy countries are over time, uh, but also in, in a, a cross-country comparison. And uh, here, this is a, a slide that I borrowed from Stephanie Onder from the World Bank Changing Wealth of Nations project. Here she, uh, she uh, shows how the, the newest report, what, what measures are taken in order to measure the wealth of nations around the globe. And uh, they add uh, in the newest report, uh, not only carbon storage, but also renewable energy uh, and uh, aquaculture. So, so also the oceans, as was said uh, in the previous uh, presentation. And then uh, another project that also really maps uh, the impact of environmental conditions on, uh, on uh, the, the well-being of nations uh, is done by the International Monetary Fund. And this is a, a graph that I borrowed from uh, the IMF blog that shows uh, different countries um, how they will, uh, how the population is expected to feel uh, due to the adverse uh, impact of rising temperatures. And you see this, uh, this is one of these graphs uh, that not only works with color, but also with the shape and the size. Uh, so you see that, that the equator belt will be uh, impacted the most. And this is, I think, these days also the innovation in, in the in the climate uh, negotiations of the United Nations that we are thinking about the disparate impact. So it's not climate change is one uh, bad thing over the entire world. There are uh, different, different actors and some uh, might even have uh, a, a rising uh, wealth of nations uh, due to warming uh, of the globe. And this is pretty much uh, where, where uh, I come in um, thanks to uh, a class that I took with Professor Semler in 2016. Um, I calculated a model on, on how the disparate impact of climate change 
uh, will will impact the world. And this is a cross country uh, data set in which I took the different uh, country temperature starting grounds. Uh, so we, we can all agree that some countries have a different uh, or a cooler mean temperature, like Canada is cooler than, for instance, Mexico. Um, then I also took the GDP composition per country. Uh, so, so countries vary how they contribute uh, to GDP by uh, agriculture, service and industry productivity. And then also in the literature, you find the top temperature for productivity per GDP sector. And with these factors, uh, with these three factors, you can measure how, how uh, much time a country has ahead until the country reaches the peak condition for productivity. And as you can see here in the graph, the greener the country, the more time the country has actually ahead. And the redder the country, and here again, the equator belt uh, really sticks out, uh, the, the less time a country has ahead until they reach kind of the peak condition by temperature. This does not include risks, uh, which is uh, the, the downfall of the, the model. Uh, so so uh, the, it's just a, a pure model. And then hopefully in a future iterations, uh, more risks uh, will be factored in. But the risks of climate change are very hard uh, to measure and to estimate, um, uh, as, as we all know from, from more sophisticated climate change models. Why I all do all of this is to show really this inequality that's inherent in climate change. And as you can see here on the left bar chart, I only plot one third of the countries that have the most time ahead in green and one third of the countries that have the least time ahead in red. Um, and when I start plotting only one third of the gains, the green bar shifts up, meaning that only a few countries are gaining uh, or have a rising GDP prospect under climate change. And the inequality that's really inherent in this, uh, these countries that have a rising GDP prospect are also the countries uh, that uh, report higher greenhouse gas emissions. So we can say that the countries that are actually causing climate change are potentially also the countries that uh, that that have the, the highest prospect um, uh, in terms of GDP gains from a warming globe. And we already now see that people are moving in these areas. Um, so there's a positive correlation with uh, climate-induced migration streams and that finance uh, flows into these areas. The only reason why I show these disparate impacts is in order to find ways how to redistribute these gains and, and or these expected economic gains into the areas that are losing out the most and the fastest and inspired at the new school uh, by philosophical roots like Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative. You should not um, uh, engage in an action uh, if you do not want to incur the consequences to you, uh, even if the consequences are not uh, happening to you, or uh, Hans Jonas, uh, a, a former New School professor, um, uh, interpretation of Immanuel Kant, who applies this to the environment and, and the relation of human beings to the, to the ecosystem. Um, but also uh, John Rawls' veil of ignorance. You should evaluate every uh, ethical dilemma behind a veil of ignorance without thinking uh, about who's, if you are going to gain or lose, but only by the whole entire impact uh, on the entire society. But also uh, coming uh, or being, being uh, knowledgeable about uh, Dimitri Nikolin's a uh, new school professor at the Department of Philosophy, uh, his work on climate fairness and, and climate justice and climate inequality. Uh, this whole model of uh, mapping uh, wealth of nations under climate change is really all meant to show how to redistribute some of the gains into the areas that are losing out the most and the fastest. I made this quite complex model. I will not uh, show you all uh, the data uh, um, right now in terms of uh, time constraints because I'm almost at the end of my presentation. Uh, but just uh, quickly, I can say that I integrated uh, the geo impact of climate change. I integrated 
uh, resilience finance. So how much uh, can a country tap into financial uh, sources or how much uh, has a country a history of, of uh, bringing finance into the service of people previously in order to, uh, to develop a scheme what country uh, should be giving uh, to, to uh, another country in terms of redistribution and those can be enacted via a taxation and bonds uh, strategy. I also um, then calculated some, some finance diplomacy indices where, uh, and, and one of the indices actually comes out of a presentation at uh, Professor Semler's uh, um, um, talks um, that uh, where someone said you also have to adjust for who is consuming uh, goods that are produced in other countries where the CO2 is emitted. And then I really uh, took this data on the consumption-based trade adjusted CO2 emissions in order to, uh, to, to uh, control for some countries, for instance, China is emitting a lot of CO2, but the goods are actually uh, consumed uh, somewhere else in the world. I think Switzerland and, and uh, high-end countries in Europe are consuming a lot of uh, these goods. So you have to control also for that in terms of for the sake of, of a general uh, justice uh, solution. Then there's also this idea of science diplomacy that science networks can help uh, to to um, push for ideas sometimes quicker than politics uh, or politicians who are more constrained uh, in terms of their day-to-day -day politics and scientists can have networks uh, and can uh, find a common ground on scientific data uh, even when when country politics are, are not functioning. So I also integrated some, some science diplomacy and uh, other economic variables. And then lastly, where does the project stand? Um, so on the one hand, I want to do more market applications. What does this really mean? Uh, that there's a peak condition for productivity. So for instance, in terms of agriculture, we still have quite some time ahead when we reach uh, overall as the world, the peak condition by climate for, for productivity. That's the good news. But uh, the, 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 the strange news are that definitely agriculture productivity will shift. Some countries that were highly productive in agriculture will uh, potentially lose this ability, so have a decline, declining wealth of nations, whereas other countries that might have been covered in ice will all of a sudden have a lot of land uh, arable available. Then in terms of the industry uh, peak condition, we can say that we are currently overall in the entire world living in a time where we shift more from uh, from heating devices to cooling devices and then in terms of the service sector industry uh, one thing is really notable that the overall uh, temperature uh, change in the world will soon lead uh, in some countries uh, to conditions that the, the water will will not be uh, as fresh um, because as, as, uh, as the temperature rises above a certain level, the preservation of fresh uh, water becomes very hard because, because uh, bacteria is growing in it naturally. Um, so, so clean, uh, fresh water is uh, allegedly the gold of tomorrow uh, because we are uh, expecting to run out of uh, clean water in, uh, in uh, different countries of the world soon. And this is the very last point, which uh, really beautifully ties into uh, the previous presentation. Um, uh, so I already uh, a while ago, so I think the data goes back until 2017, um, I looked into commodities data of uh, cereals, uh, so, so wheat, barley, rice, um, um, uh, sorghum, so, so uh, commodities, uh, but also beverages um, uh, in terms of coffee, um, and tea. And you see that there is, uh, since the 2008 World Financial Recession, actually an elevated uh, um, um, price level of food. And then I would love to do in a more stylized model, um, uh, would uh, start thinking about scarcity of different commodities. And uh, I really learned a lot from the previous presentation how I could set up this model. So, so hopefully, uh, if Professor Semler uh, does his next uh, talk, I can share more uh, actual physical data on this. Uh, one thing that I already right now I'm working on, and I hope this presents or prepares the stage for the next presentation, is uh, the Ukraine crisis. And that definitely uh, had an impact 
even in the US on uh, dollar prices uh, per gallon of, of gasoline. And gasoline kind of, when the gasoline price uh, rises, then uh, also commodities are usually um, um, harder to, to, um, to maintain or uh, to preserve or uh, to prepare. So that is usually also connected to this. So even um, what are the, the political influences on different price mechanisms uh, and, and how do day-to-day -day politics uh, move uh, prices of commodities? In the US, that's the country where food is the cheapest uh, in terms of how much people earn. But uh, when you uh, extrapolate this into countries around the world uh, that, that are uh, where people have to actually use their savings in order to have nutrition, uh, an elevated uh, food price uh, is uh, definitely going to push uh, some, some uh, people to the margins. Uh, and uh, I hopefully I'll learn uh, more about uh, the impact of the Ukraine crisis on economic terms from the next presentation. And with this, I thank you very much. For for the time and attention and very much look forward to any comments also in the chat. Please. Thank you for the great talk. I just, before we get to the question, I want to just contrast what we do now, what you presented and what Alex Alanis has presented. You see, we can't hear you well, we can't hear you well is looking, so to speak, into, into the future, who will gain and lose. He was looking into the past, who was causing the loss, the damages and losses that are coming. Now, these two principles of justice, as you would say, or fair transition, as you can see, um, are not necessarily the same in terms of uh, uh, who has to pay more now, you see. Russia and Canada is gaining a lot, according to it, what possibly happening so in the future. But with respect to who causing this, the Europeans get away very easily, as you can see. Uh, uh, with this uh, criteria of uh, justice, so there is this tension of these two criteria of justice, so to speak. That I want to point out only. And I didn't have the chance to do that before, but uh, that's uh, something to um, discuss. Okay, um, Ibrahim, you want to, you are still the chair of this. You want to uh, step in and uh, manage the discussion, or uh, shall we do that from here? Uh, well, I'm, for, I mean, I'm, I'm sharing. I think the next session, not this one. Oh, well, okay. yeah. okay. good. Then we do it from here. Okay. Your turn. Excellent. Uh, interesting talk. I was a little concerned about your pictures of Canada and uh, I want to say Soviet Union, but I have to remember it's Russia now um, as as winners. Uh, in terms of agriculture, the Canadian Shield has very, very thin soil that's also acidic. And I don't know if you're familiar with the work with limnologist and ecologist David Schindler. He's a very famous Canadian ecologist, but Basically, he was showing that with the increase in temperatures, you're getting crown fires going from a sequence of every 60 to 70 years down to every about 10, and it's burning the soil. So anywhere where you have thin Canadian sealed soil, you're not going to plant anything. What's left is the pudsels or spudsels, depending on how which group you're from. And those soils are highly acidic, pHs of 6 to 4. So... You cannot grow them without literally digging all the way down through the organic layer, the A layer, the alluviation layer, to the alluviation B layer, which is clay, and literally digging up, adding in lots of ash, and mixing it together. So I, I see you having this idea that, well, we'll just move the agriculture north. No, we're not, because we don't have good soil. And even though the temperature might be fine, this is not going to be good. This is real trouble. We, combined with the last lecture, we're up against a wall. All the good soil got moved south during the last glaciation. What's up there now can't be used. You want to answer now? Yeah, just quickly. Thank you very much. This is exactly the reason why I have not integrated risks because I'm not a regional expert of, of all the countries in the data set, but it's very 
very much appreciated that you share these thoughts and I will definitely uh, think about it uh, that that uh, just because my eyes is moving does not mean uh, there's more productivity. I will definitely read up on it, especially uh, when when thinking about top temperature literature. Thank you. Yeah. So there are also maybe huge risk in Russia from the climate risks and climate disasters and disruptions. So it is also a cost which is not taken into account. Yes. Okay. Other questions? No? Questions from the Zoom participants there? No? Okay, then uh, Julia, many thanks. Very inspiring because it has big consequences so to speak, who should pay now the required funds uh, for adaptation and uh, uh, mitigation of the low-income countries, right? So this uh, two views have uh, maybe different implications, uh, views in the morning and above you. <laughs> so, all right, so let's move to the next presentation. Uh, Ibrahim, you are taking over or shall I do this? Sorry. The next presentation, I think, is uh, one second. Natalia. It's Natalia, right? So I think you, you probably better because they said you are in front of the presenter. <laughs> okay. Okay, but okay, but I guess I will tell. Just I'll, I'll keep track of time. I'll keep track of time. Okay, okay. So thank you a lot for this time and your patience and your attention to Ukraine. But maybe uh, my view of the ESG perspectives is a bit different that you are all expecting because you know that just for providing a good research, we have to have data. And right now it's very difficult to have this data because war is still going on. So that's why we just trying to figure out uh, the future way, how to reconstruct, how to restore our assets, our resources. And that's why I will highly appreciate any suggestions, how we can go deeper into details and what should be our priorities for the recent future future decades. Okay, uh, so if you don't mind, uh, if you don't mind, I just will use my notes uh, because I'm still a bit worried about my English. I'm just here for two months, three months uh, in the United States, so I'm still working on it. Okay, so um, what I would like to say, so first of all, uh, the Ukrainian e economy has struggled to operate at its full uh, potential for several decades. And we all know that economic production has been inconsistent, development has remained below that of European uh, neighbors, and unemployment has been consistently high. Although pover poverty has fallen since uh, 2017, Ukraine remains a lower middle economy country. And uh, in the same grouping as Nigeria, Ghana, and Pakistan, with a per capita gross national income uh, around $1,000 to $3,000. The ongoing war uh, drastically defined existing macroeconomic uh, issues and created new threats uh, we will overcome in several decades. However, even in these challenging times, it's vital to develop plans for Ukraine's reconstruction so that the recovery can start as soon as possible. I will focus on a brief review of ESG concerns that are actively discussed today in Ukraine and may impact the success of Ukraine's recovery in the post-war period. My suggestion for this talk uh, is uh, to modify the general understanding of ESG from a company's perspective, perspectives, as we all already know, uh, into the environmental, social, and government factors that investors and other uh, stakeholders measure when analyzing a country's uh, sustainability efforts from a holistic view. 
Uh, given the time limitation, I also put my timer just to control uh, it. Uh, this talk necessarily leaves out a number of other uh, super important areas, such as a micro macroeconomic framework or for financial stability, trade policies, institutional development, etc. And I will focus first on the brief estimations uh, of damages caused by the war, and then I cover the main my and other researchers' concerns from the ESG perspective that are commonly recognized and nonetheless, some of them still require special attention. Um, okay, so up to now, a joint assessment released by the government of Ukraine and leading international institutions in March 2023 20, uh, estimate the cost of reconstruction and recovery in Ukraine around 400 billion of US dollars. And that estimate uh, only covers a one year uh, period from the start of the invasion to the first anniversary. Continued Russian attacks, including the bombing of Ukrainian energy infrastructure and the disastrous destruction of the Kahovka Dam, have the driven that figure up further, of course. The longer the war lasts, the more the cost will increase. And let's look uh, into some figures. So uh, according to the damage assessment provided by a leading economic institution, Kiev School of Economics, uh, that um, launched a very good uh, project, uh, the Russia will pay. So um, they are trying to uh, fix, uh, to uh, let's say, to highlight how many damages we still have. Uh, and uh, according to that data, we have to say that total documented direct damage in Ukraine's infrastructure has reached uh, 92 million of square meters or 151 billion uh, of US dollars at replacement cost. The ongoing war continues to result uh, in the destruction of residential buildings, educational institutions and infrastructure, leading to an increase in the overall damage. Of course, we have to pay attention to ecosystem disaster. The war in Ukraine, a highly industrialized country, severely threatens the environment and public health, not only in Ukraine, but in whole Europe. Damaged and destroyed infrastructure significantly pollutes the environment and leaves behind sometimes economic and social consequences. Military operations lead to significant negative environmental consequences. This includes harm to people, through contact with harmful substances, inhalation of gases, soil and water pollution, and destruction of forests. Uh, accordingly, the data, the recent one that I was uh, able to find, so we have to say that uh, around 56 billion of US dollars estimated damages to the environment caused by the hostilities at the June 2023. The hostilities cause a vast number of fires that destroy property and nature almost every day. War increases uh, greenhouse gas emissions and accelerates uh, climate change. During the first year of the war, uh, 119 million tons of CO2 to emissions of greenhouse gases were caused by the war. So let's say in comparison, this is kind of uh, Belgium uh, emissions that was done during the 2021. So um, well, moving forward, uh, we would like, uh, I would like to emphasize that given a special focus to the crucial role of agriculture sector, I should, uh, it should be highlighted that the impact of Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine is immense. Based on the research estimates, as of February 2023, direct damage amount to eight billion of uh, US dollars, and indirect uh, cost amount to additional 32 billion of US dollars. To cover the need for reconstruction and recovery, uh, we will need approximately, but of course right now this is a different number, 29 billion of US dollars. And don't forget that 30% of Ukrainian territory is still contaminated with mines, and we will need up to 30 years to demine the territory of Ukraine. Of course, we have to remember that Ukraine is uh, home to 35 of uh, Europe's biodiversity, but leaving behind this important issue, uh, I would like to turn your attention to the main uh, environmental concerns that probably uh, you already have and you already know, but let's say I would like to emphasize some of them that we all in Ukraine are uh, saying that they are super important and uh, highly demanded to uh, 
investigate uh, with the help of international society and researchers. So first of all, energy sector reconstruction. The energy sector plays a vital role in Ukraine's green recovery. 42% of emissions are produced by the outdated energy sector infrastructure, which has significantly destroyed, was destroyed, sorry. According to the Ukrainian government assessment, uh, 3 billion of uh, US dollars is needed to, uh, in 2023. The key requirement is that Ukraine's recovery should be not a return to the pre-war status, but full-fledged development. Take into account the European Green Deal, which is also a guarantee of meeting the Copenhagen criteria for the EU accession. At the same time, certain proactive civil society organizations, uh, they maintain that the green uh, restoration of Ukraine needs to empower, uh, needs to empower local self-government, or uh, we have a special name like Gramade local communities, focus on transparency and involve the public in the decision-making process in terms of reducing the corruption risk. Another risk, risk uh, I would like to uh, call it like green versus fast reconstruction. So what I mean by saying that, Ukrainian business environment is heavily regulated. So in terms of um, uh, World Bond Bank Easy of Doing Business Index uh, on uh, 2020, position of Ukraine was 70 out of 100. So just in comparison, US uh, is having 95 uh, points of, out of 100. And companies and private housing that are willing, really willing to set up energy efficient facilities face particular administrative barriers and are struggling with the lack of funding. That's, that's much easier uh, and faster to reconstruct infrastructure and housing using cheap materials and resources rather than start negotiations with utility state companies or wait for government funding support. Implementing green reconstruction requires a combination of a combination of program design and policy to ensure uh, that uh, decentralized decision making is guided towards green reconstruction, existing obstacles to green investments such as highly regulated wholesale market prices uh, in the electricity sector needed to be eliminated. Uh, nonetheless. Particular issue is connected uh, with the national legislation on environmental impact assessment in terms of receiving compensation uh, for environmental damage. And you see on the slide how many directives of uh, EU we have to update or sometimes even just a copy uh, and uh, to use it for our future needs. And uh, also I have to mention here, of course, the question of nuclear power. Ukraine is heavily dependent on nuclear energy. It has 15 reactors generating about half of its electricity. But what we know that uh, Ukraine um, lifetime of the most uh, Ukrainian um, nuclear power plants in country and uh, their life and lifetime is ex uh, surely expires between uh, next five years. And uh, of course, uh, we need to replace these uh, power plants or it's better to change for uh, that technologies that should uh, be implemented according to the green uh, strategy of uh, reconstruction. And the last one that I would like to mention here, of course, some discussions that we have still in Ukraine about the, let's say, greenness of the recovery plan that was developed by the National Council of Ukraine. Uh, and presented in Lugana in 2022. Uh, they uh, stress that um, our government stressed the gover uh, that um, compared to um, uh, following uh, European recovery uh, in response to COVID-19, plans for Ukrainian green spending are low. So it should be higher. And some researchers, they uh, really did a good um, uh, investigation in terms of how to identify which, what kind of initiatives uh, really follows this uh, green recovery idea and requirements of the EU. Okay, let's move on further and um, 
I would like to stress here that, of course, it's super important to talk uh, about environmental concerns and how we can protect our planet and how we can reduce emissions and uh, how we have to or we should help to Ukraine, help Ukraine. But uh, at the same time, uh, we shouldn't forget that all these actions, they are really uh, depend on uh, human capital and on government's efficiency. That's why I would like to also stress out here some my concerns or such, let's say, some uh, key points that really um, may matter for Ukrainian recovery. First of all, let's talk about um, human capital uh, uh, depletion and what is going on, just taking into account numbers. So uh, since February 24th, millions were forced to leave their homes seeking asylum abroad or uh, safer regions of Ukraine, because you know that many people just uh, became uh, internally displaced persons and moved from east to west and to the south of Ukraine. According to the United Nations latest data uh, on November 2023, there are around five to six million refugees currently living in Europe, including 1.5 million in aggressor states and 3.6 million in uh, internally displaced. And the war cost and will cause the subsequent adverse long-term effects on productivity and output arising mainly from, of course, lower educational outcomes and skill losses and reduced working abilities of the working age population. That because you know that how many men right now are dying and how many women uh, just left Ukraine with kids because of the war. And they are all uh, belong to uh, working uh, able population. And uh, according to the research, um, we are expecting that um, a total factor of productivity dri driven by reduced human capital will fall uh, by 7% uh, by 2035. And uh, Ukraine will likely face a demographic crisis and significant workforce deficit after the war. Um, according to the uh, forecast uh, of our consideration of employers, Estim uh, they estimate that the labor force might shrink from 70 million before the war to 11 million after the war. And uh, of course, with million, uh, millions of Ukrainians taking refugee status abroad, the capacity uh, of economy to grow will be significantly limited. Um, other consequences I um, summarized uh, on this slide, uh, just using a quantitative and qualitative approach, and also it based from my experience because I'm also like a refugee, and uh, that's why I really understand what does it mean and why it's important to pay attention to human capital issues uh, in general. Um, and um, what uh, I would like to highlight here uh, in terms of uh, future perspective of Ukraine. So first of all, um, let's talk about brain drain that uh, really for me as professor, as educator is really important. So according to the data, around 47% of refugees have a university educational level and 14% of refugees found an occupation in education field abroad. Of course, education in Ukraine has suffered because of the direct damage uh, to the buildings. But what is more important, uh, it has a significant um, uh, trouble and it is suffered a lot because of the brain drain of kids, students, researchers, teachers leaving the country and potentially not coming back. Many teachers and university professors and scientists were able to find jobs abroad. And under other circumstances, the, the international experience and high qualification foundation obtained by professors and researchers in developed countries during the war may benefit Ukraine's recovery, but probably not in this case. The second point, Ukraine is not ready to cover all health and living needs for veterans, injured people, and internally displayed people, displaced people. Even if government agencies, NGOs, and other organizations are providing a certain level of financial, educational, and basic needs support, it's still highly demanded, especially psychological restoration, because many people right now are coming back from the war and they really don't know how to uh, be uh, integrated into civil society that are still living the same life as it was. And also the uh, last danger that I would like to highlight here is the prospect of 
prospect of EU integration. Uh, let's say that if, if in general we have to say that it's super good and amazing that we Ukraine um, obtained a chance uh, to become a part of the United Nations. But at the same time, I have worries, and not only me, that uh, due to the expected liberalization of cross-border movements, Ukrainian students and people, they are definitely will try to find a peaceful place in Europe, and it will increase immigration issues in Europe. That, but because of what? Because uh, it's really uh, not uh, impossible to stay in Ukraine if we will feel uh, this uh, uh, risk of future war because of our uh, neighbor, even if right now we would like, uh, we, will, we will start a kind of negotiation. But this uh, risk uh, about uh, loss uh, in security in the future will uh, definitely cause an immigration issue in Europe. Okay, uh, so uh, next. Um, and next, what I would like to consider here as um, the government's factors. Um, of course, when we are talking about government's, government's factors uh, from ESG countries' perspective, so I would like to focus on the distribution of rights and responsibilities among the government and people in terms of investment attractiveness. According to the National Recovery Plan, uh, the key assumptions of the green future and uh, IU integration and national security, of course. And Natalia, uh, just just a reminder, uh, four, yeah. five more minutes. Yes, yeah, I know, I know, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I know because I have, set, I set up a timer. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, what we have to, uh, what I would like to point here. So, first of all. Um, we still uh, have uh, a very um, big concern. I mean, we like uh, Ukrainian researchers uh, who are trying to uh, evaluate uh, all uh, consequences of uh, recent uh, changes in uh, our government policy. So first of all, we still have some doubts about such a kind of issue like minority shareholder oppression. So uh, what does it mean? Uh, that means that um, uh, we, uh, wanted to follow the EU uh, directive uh, about takeover bids and implemented in uh, it um, in 2017. But as a result, uh, let's say this, um, this uh, reform and this uh, law uh, definitely didn't create a good, uh, let's say, sources for involving private investors uh, into um, corporation, uh, into uh, privatiz privatization of national um, assets. And still, uh, right now, we are expecting for the new wave of uh, purposive privatization of state-owned uh, entities. But the main worries here that we all have that uh, just because of this uh, new uh, wave of privatization, only institutional investors who will be able to buy significant amount of Ukrainian assets uh, our market and what uh, uh, what kind of consequences it may have for the economy that means that our financial market will remain in liquid and non financially uh, attractive to so uh, that's also uh, very important uh, to uh, consider uh, the second point here, uh, despite the good intention to, uh, to implement uh, FTF uh, practice into Ukrainian reality that impose enhanced financial monetary control on uh, top um, state officers, uh, it is worth noting that the National Bank of Ukraine is still working on the risk measurement procedure improvement in order to protect uh, this uh, uh, imposed um, persons, but still, still we have this. Uh, t uh, we have several uh, issues with implementation of this really good initiative uh, that would uh, li uh, eliminate uh, this risk of corruption uh, among uh, our government and other um, government institutions. And also, I would like to uh, mention here that we still um, uh, have some concerns about the financial and military support shortage caused by the new geopolitical challenges, rising democratic backsliding in Europe. As you know, recently, recently in Netherlands, we also uh, have a new leader who is following the democratic backsliding uh, ideas. And um, also, we have to mention here the overall exhaustion of military threats. 
So um, let's summarize uh, what I would like to uh, point and uh, how I would like to end. So first of all, uh, if we uh, really um, want to help Ukraine to follow the green recovery reconstruction plan. So first of all, we have to start about our security because any kind of initiatives, any kind of investors, uh, institutionals or private investors, they uh, will be afraid to come to Ukraine and to start to do these important uh, initiatives uh, in terms uh, of uh, making our uh, planet safer and greener. Thank you for your attention and uh, sorry if I took a bit more time. Thank you, thank you. Uh, quite actually interesting, but also sad situation. So uh, any questions from, from the audience and also from the online audience? I think we have a, yeah. Couple of minutes for, for questions. I want to say something. Um, Natalia is actually a professor in Odessa, and she had to leave. I can imagine why. <laughs> and uh, she has, uh, I think, one year position at Amherst at the moment as visiting professor and uh, is uh, thinking about well, um, someday the war will be over, and uh, in some way, and so what about the reconstruction in what direction? And so Europe has a lot of experience with the war uh, destructions. And there are different concepts now to rebuild a country that is destructed. So uh, the neoliberal way or the uh, uh, German uh, cooperative way uh, with uh, German uh, uh, co-determination of the labor force in factories or the British way of market so there are different ways to do it and so I think it's very important to think ahead already and that's why I give an incentive to present this here so how the reconstruction should work and the, of course the main important point was securing Ukraine. we can't hear you professor and we need to we need to okay adjust the mic again Somebody from the uh, Zoom uh, community there or no, here? Somebody there? No? Uh, I see no question from the Zoom audience. This just seems uh, so difficult, like kind of an impossible problem, because like, you're right that you can't start planning until it's over, and we have no idea when it's going to be over. And so on top of that, there's also the climate concern, which is you'd like to rebuild in a green way, but that's probably going to be more expensive. Yeah. Um, how are there other conversations going on in the Ukrainian academic community on these topics, or is this something that you're kind of developing for yourself and trying to figure out? So um, here um, I uh, summarized, of course, um, more well-grounded research, uh, research that uh, was previously done with the help of IMF and different NGOs and our government. Uh, really uh, many um, kind of uh, actions already uh, done and uh, implemented in terms with uh, main idea build back better because right now we even have this slogan like build back better that means that we do not want really reconstruct we want modern modernize our uh, we want to do modernization you see the, the difference that's why we are thinking how to uh, uh, rebuild uh, how to modernize our energy sector but let's say uh, the main idea right now that um, uh, let's say not an idea that discussion that should we start already and uh, offer foreign investors and institutions kind of insurance just in terms to say okay you are welcome to come and you have a lot of resources and well-educated people in Ukraine who are willing to participate in national recovery but how we can 
protect you from the uncertainty and from the uh, all damages that could be caused by uh, military forces of our neighbor. That's why one way is kind of insurance that probably we will offer to international investors and maybe it will uh, help to start already this process of recovery and reconstruction. But of course, uh, people who are living in Ukraine, they are they have a strong dream to first of all have a security security guarantees that they can return homes and they want to reconstruct even own homes i know many friends from nikolaev and Kherson that is more dangerous territory close to uh, uh, military um, attacks right now and they do not want to stay let's say in Odessa, is, which is more safe place, they want to come back home. And they just need kind of guarantees. And we right now, let's say in uh, a big uh, situation of exhaustion, I guess mental exhaustion, physical exhaustion. And I guess uh, we feel how, uh, you feel also how people in Ukraine are tired and we feel how all people around the world are tired because of this war. So let's say some uh, good initiatives are already implemented, but many of them are still awaiting. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for being here. This was very interesting um, and also very sobering. Um, I am curious if you could expand a little bit on the food systems aspect of this. I think you mentioned some pretty substantial agricultural damages. Um, and one thing that comes to mind for me is thinking about what you said about will the post-war reconstruction plan go back to the way things were or is there a way that it can be done better? And I think what's sad is when it comes to like ecosystem damages, it's potentially irreversible or something that will take a really, really long time to fully recover. Um, and it seems like that's an important consideration and thinking about how to rebuild Ukraine's economy. So yeah, if you could just expand upon the role of food production in general in that green recovery plan, that'd be really yeah, um, uh, thank you so much. This uh, really a question that is crucial because Ukraine is uh, agricultural country, country, and we are still, uh, let's say, a main a main partner uh, in uh, grain deals, right? Uh, and corn uh, uh, is our uh, main production in agriculture sector. But let's say, um, let's say uh, this um, this year uh, showed us that. Um, we uh, were able to keep at least 70% of our uh, resources in agriculture sector. And uh, of course, uh, we will try to protect the biodiversity and try to follow the strategy of food security. But uh, the Kachovka Dam, is still um, influence uh, uh, is have a great impact and drastic impact on uh, Ukraine uh, ecosystem, and probably we are not able to evaluate it proper uh, properly right now. So we still are awaiting for the one year at least, just to consider uh, how many damages uh, uh, was caused because of this uh, tragedy. So yes, still, let's say we know that uh, the food security and agriculture is our priority, but so many uncertainty here. Um, do we have any questions in the Zoom? Or no, it seems we don't have any questions. I have just one, just one comment you, you mentioned. That I think it's important for for capital flow, uh, it is important for capital inflows in any country to 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 kind of have a, a certain degree of security and safety, and this this is very important. So, uh, what you mentioned is really like the the basics. That uh, the sooner the better we uh, we we find a solution that uh, makes sure the financial markets. Can respond positively to the safety uh, to the safety not 
unfortunately not not only of, of, of people but also of capital that's how how investors think so, yeah you're you're definitely right thank you i just wanted to ask is it's kind of a small question it's about i see they have seven, 17 percent sunflowers in your agriculture what, what do you guys do with sunflowers uh, you mean uh, we are trying to keep it safe? <laughs> okay, that makes sense. I mean, is, is it like a, a major part of the you know, Ukrainian culture? I mean, because it's like that's... Yes, it's our, even our symbol, you know, like symbol of resist resilience. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. No, I just... I hope you, we we will be um, uh, we will have enough resources to supply Europe and the whole uh, world with sunflower oil because it's very tasty. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I also can talk uh, about Ukrainian freedom bonds. It's, it's a kind of way how to support Ukrainian military forces <laughs> and earn money a bit. <laughs> Can I have a, a brief question? I, I was not here for the presentation, but I, I, I was here for the conclusions and the discussion. Um, when talking about modernization, one of the big debates in the development literature of modernization, especially for uh, developing economies, was the origin of the investors, whether they are domestic capitalists or foreign capitalists. So I would be interested whether you could comment on that because getting in foreign investment is not always enough for modernization. Um, so whether maybe you could comment on that. What do you see the role between foreign and domestic capital in this effort of green modernization? Yeah, thanks a lot. This is also the main question that uh, is uh, very interested for me as a future investor of my country. Natalia, uh, before before you answer, Natalia, we might take another question by Joanna, and then we close because then we probably we need some okay, some break. I, I will try to be short. So, uh, so, so Joanna, no, Joanna, ask your question, and then we can you can answer both questions at the same time after. Ah, uh, okay, okay, let's. Uh... Okay, uh, Natalia, thank you for the presentation. It's just uh, one question. You mentioned that uh, in academic circles, you're already talking about uh, reconstruction and then uh, uh, build better afterwards. So would you do you think you would do that with what type of instrument? Green bonds with uh, bond insurance that would uh, perhaps guarantee the foreign investors the repayment of principal and some sort of associate interest? Or you, you would think of a different type of financial instrument for, um, for the foreign investors? Thank you. Okay, thank you. This is like a related question. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, definitely green bonds are our priority and this uh, uh, type of funding is already discussing in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, let's say um, uh, with what um, I guess what uh, what, uh, what is the main concern here should be in terms of uh, communication or collaboration with uh, foreign uh, investors or domestic investors. Of course, this uh, question of ownership uh, rights, right? And who will be able to control, let's say, Ukraine uh, during the recovery process. And um, let's say right now we don't have a common opinion because in Ukraine, we don't have a sufficient amount of funding that could be involved from the Ukrainian side. Only institutional investors can, uh, let's say, participate in privatization of uh, assets and will try to contribute uh, as much as they can. But also the good, let's not let's say a good, but uh, maybe a positive uh, sign could be considered as uh, maybe you know you know the uh, very big institutional investor here, BlackRock Capital, who is following ESG uh, strategy, even if right now they are trying to avoid using ESG as a term because it's a very politicized uh, right now. Uh, but anyway, they are trying to consult. Uh, investors uh, or in Ukraine and abroad, how to pursue green investments, how to really invest in uh, companies that are following ESG standards. And uh, honestly saying we have many good companies, big companies uh, in Ukraine that have a very high level on transparency and ESG scores. So 
probably it could be a way how to, let's say, even uh, involve in, uh, international capital uh, will uh, follow the national strategy of uh, modernization. Thank you. Thank you. I think we probably now we should oh, yeah. keep, take some time for uh, for break, right? And then we, we resume. <laughs>